The stats themselves are pretty simple. HP is pretty self-explanatory, just how many hits you can take before losing a battle. Attack is your physical attack damage. Defense is your resistance from physical attacks. Special attack is how much damage your non-physical attacks will do. Special defense is your resistance against those. And speed determines who goes first in a battle. Higher speed stat wins. If it's a tie, it is a coin flip. But the reason why I wanted to dedicate time to this before going over any Pokemon is that special attacks and physical attacks have been completely redefined. In previous Pokemon games, it was always determined by the type. If a move was fighting type, it was always physical. If it was grass type, like in this situation, it was always special. Now, it's just as simple as if the attack is physical, like say a tackle or a punch or any sort of thing like that, it is physical regardless of its type. If you're firing a beam at your enemy or something like that, it is special regardless of its type. This opens up a lot of possibilities. It makes it so that you can have multiple moves of the same type with purpose. Plus, it also gives you a lot more to consider in battle, more than just simply the type of the move, but also if it's physical or special. This makes a lot of Pokemon with weird stat distributions in the past a lot more useful now, and it's easily one of my favorite changes to the series as a whole due to that added depth. On to Turtwig itself, it is a prime example of what this means for the game. A physical attacking grass type Pokemon would not have been all that useful in a previous Pokemon game, but here, Turtwig is able to learn physical grass type moves and can do a lot of damage because of that. It's a very prime example of a Pokemon made useful by these new mechanics. Unfortunately though, with its other two big stats being HP and defense, its pure grass type doesn't really help it that much. Grass is tied for having the most weaknesses of any type with five. Um, it does resist some really helpful things though, so it, it does have that going for it. It's not a useless type. When it is fully evolved, it becomes a grass and ground type, which Again, defensively doesn't really do it all that many favors. There's not really a whole lot of weaknesses canceled out by being part ground type. However, from an offensive standpoint, that is huge. With attacks getting the same type attack bonus from both the grass and ground types, Turtwig will be able to do a lot of damage. However, I do think it is a bit harder to use than the other two options here. I would recommend it if you're experienced and want a bit more of a challenge, but that is not to say it is a bad choice at all. Second. <laughs> is Chimchar, easily one of the most solid starter Pokemon ever to exist. It is that good. Now, when it evolves, it becomes a fire and fighting type Pokemon, and I know what you're thinking, fire fighting type starter, overdone, worst Pokemon ever, case closed. Well, I think we can forgive them this time. This was only the second time that happened, and it really is just that good. It is both the fastest fire type Pokemon and the fastest fighting type Pokemon in the game in one. You're gonna be going before just about everything else you're gonna come across. It's gonna be doing a lot of damage. Its attack and special attack remain equal throughout its entire lifespan, meaning that no matter what attack you give it, it's going to be doing a lot of damage. Well, unless you're giving it Tail Whip or something like that, but I have more faith in you than that, damn it. Anyway, the only real downside I can say about Chimchar, other than it obviously not taking hits well because it is, it's a sweeper, which that kind of comes with the territory, is that by leveling up, it doesn't really learn too many diverse moves compared to what it got in later games. So if you're going strictly off level up moves, you're gonna just be using mostly fire and fighting type moves, but is that really such a bad thing? Not entirely. Last up, Piplup. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. This has the highest special attack stat of any starter Pokemon as of this point in the series. It also will become a water steel type when it is fully evolved. In this particular game, Steel's main draw is just that it resists a lot of things. It's not really offensively viable. So the main difference that you're going to get as it grows is that it's just going to gain a lot of resistances to a lot of common types. It's very useful. However, when it is in its middle stage of Prinplup, it doesn't really learn that many good moves by leveling up. It's kind of mediocre in that phase, so you will have a bit of a hill to climb with it, but if you can, it's definitely rewarding at the end of the tunnel. And if you pick Piplup and you end up not liking it, believe it or not, it actually makes a very solid HM slave, yeah. I've never thought to give HM moves to my starter Pokemon, but yeah, that's something that I recently learned, is that it actually learns a lot of them. Starly, and oh boy, it's one of my favorites. Starly, if you didn't pick Chimchar, is one of the best physical attackers you're gonna come across for quite some time. It learns a surprising diversity of moves, so unlike a lot of other early game Pidgey clones, you don't really have to worry about it getting walled by stuff that resists normal and flying all that much. In addition to that, when it evolves, it gets Intimidate for its ability. Lowering your opponent's attack stat as soon as it comes out into battle is one of the most commonly useful abilities out there, so it's definitely useful in that way making up for its poor defenses. 
let me put it this way. The only reason why I'm not catching this for my team is because I've used it in so many other playthroughs that I just want to mix things up for myself. That is the only reason I'm not catching it. Staravia! It's good for all the same reasons that Starly was, and a little bit more, actually. It starts with Intimidate for its ability, immediately making up for its lack of bulk. Starly couldn't do that. In addition, if you felt like you were lacking a good flying type, or you were just regretting not picking up Starly, you have a good opportunity here. It's competently leveled, and heck, even if you're not totally decided that you want to raise a Staravia, you have time to mull it over. You're going to find Staravia everywhere going forward. Okay, not everywhere, but just about every single area is gonna have Staravia as an encounter going forward. You're gonna have plenty of opportunities to catch it for your team if you still want some time to think it over. So yeah, very flexible for when you can add it to the team. If you don't care about being cheap, it can also do that Endeavor quick attack and double team strategy that Barry had. Beedoof! My only advice? Catch it. Yeah, simple as that. Okay, fine, I'll tell you more, but I'm not kidding. You want to catch a Bidoof. If you want to raise it for your team, it'll ultimately become a water normal type, something unique only to it, which, you know, that's nice, getting same type attack bonus from something that's not normal. Um, it's also not far off from learning Headbutt and Rollout, which are really strong moves for early game, but that's not why I would say that you most definitely want to catch it. If you wanted to raise it, it's actually one of the better Radita clones, if you ask me, but... The main reason why you want it is that Sinnoh is rich with terrible HM moves that you need to learn to progress the story, but are so bad that you would never want to teach them to your main Pokemon. Bidoof can learn so many of these moves, and you'll want it around for just that purpose, if nothing else. As much as those teeth would have you think otherwise, it is a lot more than a shameless Radita clone. And you know what? If... Yes! Yes! I am going to catch this one right here, just so that I have it for later. Not to use on my team, of course, but again... HM moves are going to be really nice to not have to worry about. Be barrel! I'm not going to beat around the bush on this one. Catch it and replace your Bidoof with it. Simple as that. The barrel is able to learn some aquatic HM moves we'll be seeing later on that Bidoof can't learn, and therefore it is a better HM user than even Bidoof is. Some people in the comments were saying, you know, hey, you know, don't neglect your Bidoof, train it up, you want to get up to be barrel for those HM moves. I don't know if people just weren't aware that you could catch a barrel in the wild not too far into the game before that's even really a problem, so... I don't know. Cricket Todd. Ugh. Okay. Only knows Growl and Bide until it evolves. Its only way of doing damage is by doing nothing for two turns and then counterattacking. It's so weak that it's unlikely to be able to survive two hits for most anything without you using items on it. It's just really not a very good Pokemon, and... Not only if you want to raise a bug type, are there better options not too far down the line, but if you want to raise a Cricketot in particular, in the not too distant future, you'll be able to catch its evolved form in the wild, meaning that it'll know more moves than just growl and bide, and in fact, its evolved form is even more common in the wild than it. It has no purpose for existing. What's the matter, Cricketot? You feeling like the obviously scrap pre-evolution of Volbeat and Ilumese that you are? Oh! I am so lame, never doing that again, wow. And Cricketoon is now catchable in the wild. If you wanted to raise a Cricketot without, well, raising a Cricketot, you can now catch Cricketoon in the wild and it has access to Fury Cutter, making it a lot more viable than its pre-evolution. Okay, fine, I'll do the thing. Da -da 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 -da, whoop! If you've never played this game before, I promise it'll make sense later on. On to Shinx. I'm gonna be more positive here. It is a physical attacking electric type, and its attack stat is actually very solid for this early in the game, even in its base form. It can get Intimidate for an ability, which is the one I would recommend out of the two, but downside of Shinx is that it doesn't learn very many good attacking moves leveling up, and since it's meant to be a physical attacker, I do have to dock it a little bit on that. It doesn't even learn that many good physical TMs either, so it's a little bit tapped in that way. It might not be a good long-term solution, but it's good early on. And even though it has legitimate problems, I can't really be mad at it. It's just so cute, other than for Abra. Anyone who's played Red and Blue could tell you what an incredible Pokemon Abra is. It eventually becomes one of the best special attackers in all of Pokemon, Alakazam. However, there are a few major hurdles standing between you and that. First off is that Abra only knows Teleport. Even though Abra has a very respectable special attack stat, 105 to be exact, which I think is the highest stat we've seen anything have up to this point in the game, it's not able to really use that. 
Its only move by default is Teleport, which merely lets it escape from a wild Pokemon battle automatically. Any TMs that Abra can learn are not accessible to us yet. In addition to all of that, it will run away if it is ever given a chance to make a move when you are battling against it in the wild. You only get one turn to catch it. Your chances of catching a wild Abra at full health in a Pokeball is 26.1%. I know this from memory. I have agonized over catching Abra that much throughout my life. It's a real pain. In addition to that, you need access to multiplayer if you want to fully evolve it as you need to trade an Abra and of course, well, trade it back to actually keep it. If you don't have access to multiplayer, you might want to pass on it. That's not to say that it's impossible to go through a full Pokemon game with Kadabra, the middle stage. It is a very respectable Pokemon in itself, and I've done it before. It's just that, well, it's not having one of the best special attackers in the game at level freaking 16. Seriously, I can't stress how good it is. Kadabra! Wait no more if you didn't want to bother with Abra at all earlier. Special sweeper, good to go, out of the box, right here. For potentially the low, low price of 200 Pokemon dollars, depending on what you catch it in. I've already gone over what makes Kadabra so good earlier when comparing it to Abra, but I'll at least repeat that it is excellent at doing damage, because when you're talking about the Abra family, it bears repeating. It really does. Can't say it enough. Best part about Kadabra is that it can evolve as soon as you catch it if you can trade, and a lot of Pokemon coming up are weak to it. It's the easy mode Pokemon of this route. Magikarp is widely considered by many to be the worst Pokemon of all. It only knows Splash, an attack that does absolutely nothing. No effects, no damage, nothing, not a zip, zero, zilch. I think I just listed all the synonyms for Magikarp right there, yeah. It evolves into Gyarados at level 20, which is a very solid Pokemon. It has Intimidate for its ability, it's a water flying type, it has some pretty good attacks, but it's gonna be a long road getting there. The fact that it can do absolutely nothing until level 15 means the only way to level it up would be to send it out into battle, switch over to another Pokemon, and have that Pokemon win, in which case the experience would be split between the two. It's just, you're better off waiting on this one if you want to raise it. You can catch higher level Magikarps later, and yes indeed, you can catch Gyarados as well, so it's not really a big concern um, for you to do that. Only in Diamond and Pearl, you are able to catch Gyarados at this point by using the Good Rod in the Great Marsh. With the excellent ability of Intimidate, only two weaknesses, the physical special split helping out its high attack stat be more useful, and some fun new moves like Aqua Tail and Ice Fang, this is a great water type for any team. You would be hard pressed to be raising a team where this wouldn't fit in at least somewhere. The best part, however, is you do not have to deal with any of the Safari Zone's crap to get this. Really, just don't even bother catching this, even if you're playing Diamond and Pearl. Pretty much anywhere you can catch Magikarp up to level 25 at this point in the game. So just do that. Level it up one time and get yourself a Gyarados. Simple as that. Badoo. This is our first Grass Poison type. You know, for that being such an abundant type that they never stop making Pokemon for, kind of surprised it took us this long to find one. This is a friendship evolution. Zubat has this in its evolutionary line as well, but I'm going over it here because Badoo needs it immediately to evolve. Friendship goes up by having it in your party, walking with it, leveling it up, uh, some other methods not available to us, of course, like always. Um, it goes down if you let it faint in battle, you feed it bitter items, or you trade it away, that kind of stuff. Badoo has potential to be a fantastic special attacker. This is the only time where a Pokemon, in this case Roselia, got an evolution and a pre-evolution in the same game. Its final evolution of Roserade was much needed. It is a fierce special attacker and one of the faster grass type Pokemon out there. It's also got two really good abilities. Both are great and worth considering, but I'd personally suggest Natural Cure for multiplayer and Poison Point for single player. Um, though, as great of a Pokemon as it is, you might want to pass if you're a night player. I say this because it only evolves during the day, and while you can cheat the clock in the system settings, this game penalizes you by locking daily events for 24 hours after you have changed the clock, so keep that in mind. Roselia is the only Pokemon ever to get an evolution and a pre-evolution introduced at the same time in a generation after it was introduced. Roselia has the capability to do some nice damage with its 100 special attack, but it's very short of its potential, as its evolution that was much needed is a lot faster than it. You'll need a shiny stone to evolve it, and we don't have that yet. 
It's far more useful in Platinum because the Shiny Stone is available a lot later in Diamond and Pearl than it is in Platinum. If you evolve it, one of the best special attackers out there and one of the best grass poison types. Zubat! If I could describe Zubat in one way, it would be useless. Until it gets wing attack. No, I'm serious. Once Zubat can get wing attack, it is a force to be reckoned with. It's a tough uphill battle for those first few levels, but if you can just get it to that point, it's very respectable. I like poison types more than most people do. Offensively speaking, it's one of the worst types out there. In fourth generation, it's only super effective on grass, but defense is where it really shines. It resists so many common types. Poison flying gives it three quad resistances, fighting bug in grass, gives it a nice ground immunity that would normally be a weakness if it was just a poison type. Not only that, but it's really fast. In fact, when fully evolved, it's tied for being the second fastest Pokemon in the Sinnoh decks. It's the perfect example of a super common Pokemon that a lot of people think is just weak. I mean, you fight it in the wild all the time, and yeah, who doesn't get annoyed at hearing its cry every 10 seconds whenever you're in any cave in any Pokemon game? It can get really frustrating to run into, and I can see why people would write it off thinking that it's weak because it's so common. But if you've never used one, you might want to try it out. Its playstyle is definitely different from Starly's, but if you want a flying type Pokemon in your team and you don't want to go with the bog standard Starly, it's something worth considering. And you know, I think it's underrated. I praise it in every Let's Play I do, and maybe I'll use one someday. Golbat. This has probably the all-around best stats of anything you can encounter right now. You already know what Zubat is like for me using it, and in addition to everything that I've said about Zubat already, this Golbat will start off with some better moves than what Zubat did, even at the same level. Um, that's not to say that you're going to be starting with Wing Attack or anything, but it is very good. However, you probably won't be encountering it due to that encounter rate. I didn't, because I didn't want to be here for hours, and like I said, and two, I wanted to have a second team member a lot sooner than this. Geodude is our new encounter for Orberg Gate. It is capable of taking hits and dealing them back for large amounts of damage. And not far from when it's caught, it learns Rollout, which is really powerful for right now. Rollout does double damage every time it is used in succession. This can get out of hand very quickly, Whitney's Mill Tank notwithstanding. And even more so, Geodude being a rock type gets same type attack bonus with it, which is even better. But speaking of its type, that's about where the positives end. There's many rock and ground types out there, and with the exception of one single shiny solid rock, if you know what I mean, they all have six weaknesses, and many of them are common types, including two quad weaknesses. With it being slow, it might be hard to use. In addition to that, it's also a trade evolution, and I wouldn't say that Graveler is as solid as Kadabra is if you can't trade to evolve it. In addition to that, Sturdy hasn't yet gotten its Gen 5 buff. You're merely just immune specifically to one-hit KO moves. Is Graveler. This is what you'd expect. Rock ground type, it's slow, it's defensive. We've been over this family before. Geodude had the advantage of knowing Rollout at a low level, and the main unique thing about raising Graveler if caught here is that it gets self-destruct at level 31. Once again, you need to trade to evolve it. We've done all this before. This was a rare encounter in Diamond and Pearl, and it's been made a little bit more common in Platinum. I like to imagine that it got tired of being so rare, so it went over to Orberg Gate, beat up all the Geodudes there, and stole their encounter rates, which is why Geodude is now somehow the rare Pokemon in that area. But I digress. Onyx, of all things, is a speedy tank, not something you see that often. High speed, high defense. In fact, the stats that you see on screen right now are of its base form to illustrate just how fast it really is. It'll be outspeeding just about everything! Okay, hang on, I gotta interrupt myself here for a minute. I just picked up an escape rope. I grabbed that item out of force of habit while I was going over Onyx. Uh, you want to make sure to get that. It's a really helpful item. I'll go over what it does in just a moment because we will be using it. Back to Onyx though. In addition to having an unusually high speed stat for what it is, you'd think for being 27 feet long it would do more damage in battle than it actually does. If you don't want to give it a huge attack stat out of fear of it having too high of a stat total, then at least give it some kind of ability that says Onyx wins against everything by merely sitting on it, because that's what would really happen in a fight. Don't take sitting away from Onyx, it's what it would do best. Other than that, Onyx when fully evolved will become a Steel Ground type. Basically, you're gaining more resistances at the cost of having a more offensively viable same type attack bonus with the Rock type. I mention this because if you want to raise an Onyx but don't have access to multiplayer, you don't need to worry about that. 
As said, even if it is just short term, Onyx does have some legitimate uses even in its base form, which is why I chose to show those base form stats. And if you want its evolve form, there is going to be a way to get it later on without multiplayer, something very good to keep in mind. Anyway, that's your lot. Steelix, yes, as a wild encounter. This one I have some memories with. When I was a kid, and I was reading up on message boards about people playing the Japanese version of Diamond and Pearl right when they had come out in Japan, it blew my mind when I saw this. Catching a hold item trade evolution in the wild. What? And like in the main story too, just, it was unheard of. It was such a weird thing to see and I felt just so good about it. You don't need to use that hold item to get it. You don't have to have other people around. You can just catch it however, like whenever you want. It's great. But uh, in all seriousness, getting into Steelix itself. It has incredible defense, but its offensive stats are not the best. It has better type coverage than you think it does. Dragon Breath is at level 33 just after you catch it. It gets the three elemental fangs through the move reminder. And that's not even factoring in all the rock and steel type moves it naturally gets. If um, you wanted to raise this, it does have reasons to be risen over Onyx. Likewise, Onyx has reasons to be risen over Steelix because of differing type and all that. Main thing is, once again, Onyx is faster than you'd think it is, so Steelix is quite a bit slower. Cranidos. If there was ever a textbook example of a glass cannon, Cranidos is it. When fully evolved, it has the second highest attack stat of anything in the game. Not only that, but its Mold Breaker ability is interesting. That would let it, for instance, hit a levitating Pokemon with a ground type move. Only Pokemon with abilities are affected though, so I don't think that means it can hit flying types with ground type moves. Other than that though, it's a rock type and it has almost complete garbage stats across the board even when fully evolved, so... This is a Pokemon that is an absolute destructive force if used correctly. There is very little it won't be able to one-shot when it is used in the right situation. Use it in the wrong situation, however, and it's probably going to go down pretty easily and not really get to do much. It's an example of a Pokemon that is great when used in the right hands, but requires a bit of experience and know-how to use. Also worth mentioning that any fossil Pokemon in Diamond, Pearl, Platinum will be level 20 upon being obtained. So already pretty competently level. On the flip side, the armor fossil gives you Shield On, which is the opposite of Cranidos in many ways. Has a better defensive typing, has some of the best defense and special defense in the game, and garbage stats everywhere else. Yeah. Shield On, I don't think is as usable in single player as Cranidos is, and that's already saying something. It's not impossible to use, and if you're looking for a good wall, you will find it here. It's just that that's pretty much all it does is stall things and wall things. It does no iron defense upon being caught, so it can raise its defense twice in one turn right from the get-go, which will be an asset to it tanking things. But just be forewarned, all you're getting here is a wall, not much else. Machop is very simple. It's the trademark fighting type Pokemon, physical attacker that happens to also be very bulky. But that's not a bad thing. And it also has the awesome ability of no guard. Attacks from neither side of the field are capable of missing while Machop is out. It doesn't really get moves that take advantage of this ability for quite a while, but trust me, it does get some. If you can get past the fact that Machop has a trade evolution coming up if you have access to multiplayer, it's definitely something you should consider adding to your team. In fact, at one point of working on this Let's Play, I planned to catch a Machop right here and raise it. I ultimately decided against it for reasons you'll see later, but yeah, it really is a great Pokemon. It's Machoke! I don't really feel the need to talk about this in too great a detail, considering I already did that back when we could get Machop back in Orberg City. But I'll say two new things about it. One, I would recommend letting it learn either Cross Chop or Dynamic Punch before letting it evolve. Either or, probably Cross Chop out of the two if you had to pick. And second, I just really want to dedicate a few seconds again to saying how awesome No Guard is. Seriously, it is such a good ability. I recommend it above Guts easily. Say aye aye. This can only be encountered in Platinum version. Should you have picked Chimchar, there are many rock types ahead that you're gonna need to worry about. The good news is, Psyduck learns Water Gun almost immediately after being caught here, so it's an excellent short-term solution to that problem. Though long-term, it's not the best option for a Water type. It stays a Psyduck until a pretty darn high level, and it might struggle to keep up. Normally, this isn't such a problem in other games because Psyduck is caught so much later in other regions, but here, it's kind of an uphill battle. That being said though, it's a decent special attacker that a Chimchar trainer might want to consider for the short term. 
Golduck! If you passed on Psyduck earlier and you were wanting to go back on that decision, its evolution lies right before you. Just don't catch it here. It appears in so many areas coming up, and you don't even need to catch it in the Safari Zone. Other than that, it's basically just a special version of Floatzel. Burmy! This is the first time that I'm going over a split evolution and talking about its evolved forms. In cases like this, I will not be using the fully evolved stats in the stats box over there. It'll just merely change as I talk about the different forms to show you what the options are. This is a very different bug type. First and foremost is that it evolves later than other, other bug types that we have seen. That's not to say that it's bad. It's not far off from learning Bug Bite, which is a really interesting move. It does damage and it'll eat the opponent's berry if it's holding one. Since a lot of bosses Pokemon carry berries, <laughs> carry berries, um, you might want to use it for that purpose. In addition, male Burmese will evolve into Mothim, who is more offensive, while females become Wormadam, who is more defensive. Evolves. Basically, whatever form it has when it evolves will determine the type that Wormadam is. It, it can become Bug and Grass type if it evolves after battling in tall grass, Bug Ground in caves, or Bug Steel in buildings. I think Bug Steel is the best of these, just because it's a very good defensive type, but the issue with that is that it's going to take a little bit of planning if you want to make it evolve inside of a building, so you're going to need to level it up a bit wisely. Mothim is more offensive, but it is a bit generic as a bug flying type. There's an abundance of these out there, and I'd really only suggest it if you want a short-term solution to all these grass types and bug types that we're fighting. Wormpole! Bug type. Early game, evolves super early, only knows Tackle, String Shot, and Poison Sting in its base form. It's defensive in its middle stage and it learns Harden. You know the drill. It's incredibly powerful early on due to its stats skyrocketing from evolving so quickly, but it might fall behind later on. The only difference is that it evolves at random into Silcoon, which becomes a Bug Flying type, or Cascoon, which becomes a Bug Poison type. It's unique in being the only Pokemon with a branched evolution that evolves even further, which is... Cool, I guess? And before this comes up, no it doesn't evolve based on gender. It's random. Trust me, I have a history with this. It's determined by a bite of personality value that has nothing to do with gender. Time doesn't influence it either. Lots of pauses for emphasis in this bio. Also, its shiny form is pretty great. Purple Silicoon! the normal, boring, cocoon Pokemon of this game. It's pure bug type, it has shed skin for its ability, it only knows Harden when caught in the wild, you know the type. But, in my opinion, these cocoon Pokemon have never been better. When caught here, they will always be level 12, meaning that in just one level, Silcoon will evolve into da -da -da -da, Beautifly, which you can also encounter 1% of the time here, but don't even bother, you're better off just catching a Silcoon, or better yet, even a Wormpole. <laughs> but, Beautifly! Being bug flying type, it is an excellent solution to everything that we've been fighting here, except maybe Pachirisu. In addition, those stats are really high for right now. It might struggle to keep up later on, just because these low level evolving bug type Pokemon don't have that high of stats long term, but you've heard that all before, I'm sure you know. The big draw though, is the fact that at level 13, as soon as Silcoon evolves into Beautifly, it will learn Gust. That is a huge edge if you didn't catch Drifloon or you weren't able to catch it, it's definitely something worth considering, if only just for that. As some side notes, I highly suggest you look up Beautifly's shiny form, because it looks really pretty. But what isn't so pretty is Beautifly's Pokedex entry. You see that cute swirly thing it's got in its mouth? It stabs prey with that thing, sucks out its fluids, and is said to be very aggressive. The Pokedex just has to turn everything into nightmare fuel. It can't just let me have a cute butterfly Pokemon. Ugh. Well, you can't have Silcoon and Beautifly without Cascoon and Dustox. Cascoon, same encounter rate, same levels caught, same everything, it's just a poison type, really. Dustox, on the other hand, defensively speaking, is the better of the two types, just from being bug poison. It also will learn Gust at the same time as Beautifly, but without that same type of attack bonus and just being a flying type itself, I don't think it's quite as useful early on as Beautifly is, so I'd probably recommend Dustox less out of the two. Combi! It's another bug type that evolves at level 20 under gender restrictions found only by using honey. Gee, sounds like Burmy has a little friend. Once it has evolved, Vespiquen has some really fun moves. It can learn Power Gem, which is a rock type move of all things, and it's also the only Pokemon capable of learning Attack Order, Defend Order, and Heal Order. Attack Order being a bug type attack, Defend Order raising stats, and Heal Order, well, healing. 
It's a decent enough Pokemon, and it is one of the better bug flying types out there out of the abundance that are made available to you. But be warned! Make sure that your combi is female. I cannot tell you how many people I knew when Diamond and Pearl came out who caught a combi, raised it, and then by the end of the game, they were asking me, Hey, when does combi evolve? I got it to level 40 and it still hasn't, and I had to break the sad truth to them that male combi is one of the most useless Pokemon ever because it never evolves. Pachi Risu! I guess there's no time like the present to finally go over this one. Pachi Risu, before I get into this, I know that there's gonna be somebody in the comments who's gonna disagree with me bringing up how Pachi Risu performed in VGC a few years back. That particular Pachi Risu performed very well in that format. It was very cool to see something with such a low base stat total perform so well. And I do have infinite respect for Sejun doing something very unique and running with it as far as he did. I think that's awesome. However, when speaking purely about single player, Pachirisu does have a pretty low stat total. It specializes in speed and special defense, oddly enough, so it is bulkier than a lot of stuff that we've seen, but it might struggle to keep up over time. On the plus side, it is going to come with Charm when caught on this route, which will lower your opponent's attack twice. That is a very good attack that should not be underestimated. I like using that in single player a lot. And it does get Super Fang, which is a pretty powerful attack in single player, lowering half of your opponent's remaining HP. Can be really strategic. Bweasel! If you're looking for the traditional bulky water type Pokemon with high special attack, you're not gonna find it here. Also, I like as soon as I praise Zubat for hitting with Super Sonic all the time, it missed right there. Anyway, Bweasel! It is a fast water type that focuses on physical damage, something that would have never flown in previous generations, or swam in its case, maybe reached if you want to meet in the middle there and Zubat has missed that thing three times now jeez and now I'm getting hit by fury swipe sorry it's just really hard not getting distracted by that considering just how uncanny the timing is come on Zubat please do not go down on me right here Pli you missed a four four well I guess I'm getting the hell out of dodge right now so much for thinking that Zubat can handle this anyway Weasel. it has decent stats for sweeping it's definitely not a weak Pokemon but most of the moves it gets leveling up are water and normal types. So if you want more diversity, you might need to go with TMs. Other than that, it's a good sweeper of a type that you don't typically see as a sweeper. Find Floatzel. You'd think with the sea of creepy Pokedex entries out there, this thing would use that finger on its neck to drown people, but no, it's actually a lifeguard true to its appearance. As previously stated, the Buiza line is a physical sweeper, and it learns moves like Aqua Jet and Crunch to support this. We're actually not far off from being able to teach Floatzel Ice Fang in the very next town, no less, so um, yeah, no better time to get it. Cherubi, this is anything but your typical grass type, doesn't learn many status moves, and it's oddly fast. It's built around functioning with the move Sunny Day, which it will learn leveling up. If you've got a fire type on your team or something like that, it might be worth considering because sunlight powers up fire type moves and weakens water moves. Shellos! If you are looking for a bulky water type Pokemon, you will find it here, and so much more. Shellos, when fully evolved, becomes a water ground type, only having one weakness, grass. In addition, it gets the moves Water Pulse and Mud Bomb almost immediately after you catch it. Those are powerful moves this early on, and they remain useful for quite some time. Believe it or not, it's so good that I recommend catching it now more than waiting for its evolution. Because its evolution has a harder time getting the moves Water Pulse and Mud Bomb, and you're still going to be using them that much later. Honestly, if you want any sort of tanky Pokemon, Shellos is something very worth considering. I even considered using it on my team for a while, and I just barely decided that I didn't want to go for it. But that's not to say that it's bad at all. It's very good. Gastrodon! Only in Diamond and Pearl. Seriously, I am getting really jealous of all these Pokemon encounter changes that they got rid of in Platinum. And they got rid of it to make room for Roselia and Sudowoodo. Gastrodon has one of the best types out there. Bulk and power. It has Body Slam at level 29, which is roughly the level it'll be caught at. Unlike Shellos, you will need a Heart Scale to get its better level up moves because its next move after Body Slam is Muddy Water at level 41. Easier stats, but rougher moves than Shellos, so pack some Heart Scales if you want to use this. Heracross. Look at those stats! It doesn't evolve! That's what it has right now if you were to catch it. It has Guts for an ability, and it also has some pretty decent bulk. It's not frail for being an attacker. It is not far off from learning both Aerial Ace and Brick Break, which will make quick work of just about anything you're going to be encountering for a long time. We've been fighting a lot of grass and bug types, and that's not going to end anytime soon. 
If you want a good physical attacker, Heracross is one of, if not the best in the business as of this point. The only real downside of it is that that ability only activates when it has a special condition, and while there are some strategies you can do to purposely inflict it with a status condition, you're not going to be seeing that for a little while, just saying. But that's not a problem, it's just that darn good, let's be honest. Apom! It's a very generic and weak normal type Pokemon. Until this generation, that is! Apom was very in need of an evolution, and it got one. A good one. You can only encounter Apom at pretty low levels because honey trees don't have their levels go up as you go throughout your adventure, so evolving it will never get any easier. But if you can get it up in levels until it can learn the move Double Hit, you will get greatly rewarded. It is a great annoyer learning moves like Fake Out and tons of TMs. It is great if you want to go for that. But it will be a tough road getting there. Drifloon! Drifloon is our first ghost type, specifically it is ghost flying type. It's an HP oriented tank, which is honestly pretty great considering it allows it to stand up to pretty much anything. Its immunities to normal fighting and ground are also really nice, allowing it to switch in a lot. Though, it has a fair number of weaknesses, five to be exact, so it might not be the best type in all situations. In Diamond and Pearl, it was level 22 when encountered, which was amazing! It was utterly broken if you could obtain it at this point. It's only level 15 in Platinum, though, it will know Gust when obtained, making it very good at fighting all these grass and bug types that we've been encountering. Bunary, and it's not very good. It learns some weird moves such as Frustration and Jump Kick. It's the only Pokemon that learns Frustration by leveling up, which does more damage the more the Pokemon doesn't like you. And speaking of which, most happiness evolutions have at least some base happiness to make it easy on you. Not Baneri. It starts with the minimum possible. It is the hardest friendship evolution at all. And it, whoa! As soon as I, oh ho ho! As soon as I bring up Zubat potentially being higher level than Bodhi. Level 21 and Confuse Ray. So Confuse Ray's got fewer PP than Supersonic, but Supersonic, 55% accurate. Confuse Ray, 100% accurate. This just got really, really cool. <laughs> well, uh, from baggage to best team member in a span of like one and a half episodes, your victory, there is nothing strange about it. Yeah, because I got Zoob out of my side. I think I will look around here just a little bit more, just to. I don't have a repellent. All right, Buneary. Never finished that thought because Zubat interrupted me with its greatness twice. <laughs> Buneary is the hardest happiness evolution of all. Whereas most Pokemon have base happiness to make things a little easier on you and trying to make them friendly towards you, not Buneary. It has zero. The thing's a spoiled brat, if I may be frank. <laughs> if you want to look for some bright side, I. I guess it's fitting that it's the only Pokemon to learn frustration by leveling up, but that's the only positive I could really find. Well, Ghastly! You can only find it this early in Platinum, so it is available a little sooner than in Diamond and Pearl. It is a Ghost Poison type, which is a pretty good defensive type to boot, in addition to it being a really mean special attacker. It also has 100 base special attack as a Ghastly, so that's very respectable. What is not so respectable is that it's not going to have any moves to take advantage of that for quite a long time. And there's not really many TMs that you can get right now that it's able to learn. It's going to be very weak, going to be very frail, not doing much damage, not being able to take hits. All around going to be kind of hard to use. If you can get through that, you will get a very respectable Pokemon on the other end, and it does have a trade evolution involved if you can handle that. But I'd personally recommend waiting on this one a little bit longer, but that's just me. Misdreavus! Oh boy, I got a history with this one. If Ghastly sounds a bit too tough to raise because of its weak moves, Misdreavus is a little bit better in that regard. Though I wouldn't say that Misdreavus ever becomes as crazy good as Ghastly ultimately does when it evolves. Misdreavus is more viable than it ever has been thanks to it getting a much needed evolution though. Just like Murkrow, you're gonna need a Dust Stone to evolve it. Murkrow! You can only find this in Diamond, which this brings me to something that really bugs me. Why are version exclusives in the regional Pokedex a thing in the third version? Not only were the first two versions out for a couple years at this point, but just everyone's playing through the third version at the same time. You're not going to easily find local trades around you for these... Uh, never mind, I'm digressing. Anyway, Murkrow is a decent mixed attacker. Oddly though, even though it has a nice special attack stat, it never learns a proper special attack through leveling up. I don't get it either. 
You'll need a Dusk Stone to evolve it, which is not coming up for a while. But it is at least more viable than it was in previous games because it can actually evolve. It was something in need of an evolution, and it got one. Just be prepared to use some TMs on it if you wanted to be a true mixed attacker. We still glam meow. I'm just gonna be concise and to the point. I don't like this Pokemon. It's only found in Pearl version, so that makes it really elusive. And I remember it being one of the last Pokemon that everyone I knew needed when completing their Cinder Dex. Heck, it was the last Pokemon I hadn't caught, other than Perugly in my Cinder Dex when I first played Diamond version. It really isn't good or helpful, not only because of its elusiveness, but also just how late it comes in the game. And it didn't have to be this way. Glammeow learns Fake Out at level 1, and Hypnosis at level 13. If you could catch this in an early area, it would be very helpful, at least for the beginning of the game, just from those moves alone. But it comes too late, there's stronger normal types already available to you, odds are in this day and age you're not playing Pearl version, and we're gonna be fighting tons of types of Pokemon that normal is just simply not good against in the coming areas. It could have been good, but it's just obsolete and there's no reason to pick it up. Now, on with the video. Perugly. Only in Pearl version, and don't let the tough battle against Mars fool you. This is one of the worst normal types out there. It learns surprisingly few moves despite what its type would lead you to believe, and pretty much any other normal type has been available to you for an eternity by this point, and does the same things only better. Its only real saving grace is that despite its appearance, it's actually quite fast. But even then, it's not the fastest in the world. Ambipalm is pretty much a better Perugly, and in all versions of the game instead of just one. Goldeen! This would be useless prior to Generation 4 because it's a physical water type, but like we've seen with Buizel, that can definitely be good now. It's the only family of Pokemon capable of learning waterfall leveling up, which could be good. I think that Buizel has more going for it in stats, while goldeen has got more going for it in moves, but a lot of Goldeen's good moves are gotten later in life, so keep that in mind. Barboach, the water ground type. I don't like Barboach quite as much as Shellos, but you can't argue with that type. It's bulky thanks to having loads of HP, it gets water pulse soon after it's caught, can get earthquake leveling up, not much else to say. It's pretty good, only weak to grass. Zwiscash, oh as always, gotta love that water ground type, surf and earthquake combo. We've previously talked about Barboach, and this is just another chance to get it. This Jingling, its name is so fun to say, and it's so cute. It is, oddly, a slow psychic type. It knows confusion upon being caught, which might be attractive, but I like how I just described a Christmas bell as attractive, wow. Um, but it doesn't really have much to justify that low speed. Its type isn't all that good defensively, and it doesn't really have good defensive stats either. This would be fine if it evolved into something really useful. Chimeco is also not really that great. The big issue that I have with Chingling, though, is why was this not a Steel Psychic type? Just look at it. I know that it would have lost that typing when it evolved, but still, this thing is begging to be Steel Psychic. Chimeco. Why are you always a rare late game Pokemon? This is a 1% encounter rate, and your reward is just a levitating pure Psychic type with mediocre stats. As far as moves, it never gets Psychic by level up. Best you're gonna get is extra sensory at level 46. There's been so many better Psychic types in our journey up to this point, and if you really wanted Chimeco, Chingling has been available since Eterna City, and you should already have one. Positives? I guess grasping at straws, I like its cry, it's very ear-pleasing. That's about the best thing I can say about it. Yeah, I'm not really a fan. Stunky. With a Poison Dark type, it resists so many things, is immune to Psychic, and only weak to ground. True to its evolution's name, it is a tank through and through. The biggest problem with Stunky, and I don't mean it's horrible gas, seriously, you don't want the ability stench you want Aftermath, is that it doesn't really get good moves until it gets up there in the levels. You can catch it in later areas, once again only in Diamond, and its evolution is obtainable in the wild later on, but just be forewarned on that, I'm not sure I'd recommend catching it here. What Scun Tank? For being a tank and only being weak to ground, it definitely gets some points. It also has a lot of HP. It has some nice moves coming up pretty soon if you didn't get Stunky earlier. Night Slash at 32, Flamethrower at 34. Also, hilariously, it learns Explosion leveling up at 64. 
I can't imagine a worse fate for a Pokemon in battle than having a skunk explode on it. Okay, that's just gross, but seriously, it's a decent tank. Metatite. This is meant to be a mixed attacker, and it's pretty cool that a fighting psychic type exists with the physical special split in effect, but its learn set wasn't updated very well. For a long time, it's going to only have hidden power and confusion for attacking moves. This is not a deal breaker, as those are fine moves, but it's just not going to be the mixed attacker that it was meant to be for several levels and until you get some later TMs. So just be warned about that. Medicham. This is our first time being able to catch this in the wild. Platinum players will be able to get this later. I thought I would go over it because it's actually important to something that we're going to be seeing pretty soon. Um, it is the evolved form of Metatite, which we went over a while back, and everything I said about it still stands. It is a mixed attacker that just learns physical attacks leveling up. If you want it to be a true mixed attacker, you're going to need to use TMs on it. And if you don't want to use TMs on it, then you might as well use something else. Second is Bronzor. This is a really neat Pokemon. It might be too slow for most people's tastes, and it might not be that good in single player in everyone's eyes, but its type alone makes it worth considering. Its abilities are the perfect complement to its type. Heatproof turns a fire weakness into normal damage, while Levitate makes it immune to ground. Ground and fire are the only two weaknesses it has, so either way, it only has one weakness, and it's up to you which one it has. That is cool. Of course, as one would expect, it doesn't output much damage. Good attacking moves are also pretty far off, but if you're looking for a wall, Bronzor will not let you down. Poison immunity is also great for the upcoming gym. Bronzong! Everything about Bronzor is true here. Heatproof and Levitate are both excellent abilities. Its type is frustrating for most opponents to deal with in conjunction with those abilities. I love the idea of it only having one weakness and it's up to you to choose which one it has. You have seen me struggle against this family of Pokemon more than once. You know the drill. As a bit of a fun fact, um, the Bronzong Pokedex entry states that it was said to bring rain to crops in ancient times. Personally, I like the strategy of Rain Dance with Bronzong if it has Levitate, because if it's raining, it effectively has no weakness. Just kind of a neat little thing. I don't know if that was an intentional wink to a strategy that you could do with it, but I thought it was neat to mention nonetheless. Ponyta, you can only catch it this early in Platinum version. It is a physical sweeper, oddly enough. Yeah, it's not one of the better fire types out there. While it is very fast, its moves don't really complement its stats all that well. On the plus side, it can get Flash Fire for its ability, which is the one that I easily recommend out of the two. If you know your opponent's about to use a Fire-type move, just switch into it. It takes no damage, and its Fire-type moves will do more damage after being hit by one. It's a really solid ability, though it's not the only Pokémon in the game that gets this ability, and I think there are better options even for this strategy. If that hasn't swayed you away from it, then that evolution level probably will. Level 40? When you're catching it at like level 6? Are you serious right now? I mean, oh, okay, looking on the positives, it can be good as a short-term solution because after Orberg City, we are going to be fighting a lot of things that are weak to fire types. Bonsly! Very easy evolution here. This is a new evolution method of the fourth generation. Some Pokemon, if they are taught a certain move and then leveled up, they will evolve. In this case, it's Mimic that you want to learn. Bonsly gets Mimic at level 15, meaning you should be able to get Sudowoodo in just one level. As for the Pokemon itself, pure rock type isn't the best for tanking, and it's especially slow even for rock type standards. Plus, neither ability is going to get much use. If you want to raise it, you might want to consider teaching it some moves by means other than level up, because leveling up, all it learns is a bunch of rock and dark type moves, not much variety. You finally have access to the Sudowoodo family! Why they made Bonsly accessible through so much of Diamond and Pearl, but just like none of Platinum, I have no idea why. But the point is, it's here right now and you can catch it. The most noteworthy thing that I can say about it that I didn't say about Bonsly is that through use of a heart scale, you can teach Sudowoodo Wood Hammer. And if it has Rockhead for its ability, that's a dangerous combination. Unfortunately, that's about all the use that either of its abilities are going to have in this particular game. It does learn some pretty nice moves though. It gets low kick also through a heart scale. It learns some good rock type moves, gets sucker punch, gets hammer arm. It's got pretty good coverage. Downside is low speed and kind of a poor type. Mime Jr. It also learns Mimic at level 15 and evolves through the same method. 
So again, only a baby for one level. Why not just give us wild pseudo widows and Mr. Mimes in that case? Anyway, this is a decent psychic type between good special attack, special defense, and the moves that you would expect from the type. It's not exactly unique, but it's not really a bad thing to be a generic psychic type attacker now, is it? Just remember, it's not a fairy type yet. Mr. Mime, if you are playing Platinum, this is your first opportunity to find this family, as we could not encounter Mime Jr. earlier, similar to how your first opportunity to get the Suda Widow family was also after Sir. Mr. Mime is not the greatest psychic type attacker out there, but it's decent enough. And if you want to use something different for the sake of being unique, it won't let you down. It also learns some nice support moves such as Light Screen and Reflect that can help out the whole team. This game and give you repels from the start, but no. It's the one game where they're actually stingy with them. Anyway, let's talk to this hiker. I have a professor friend and this is what he told me. If you leave a pair of Pokemon with the daycare, sometimes eggs are found. Well, uh, this guy, if you were playing Diamond and Pearl, he would give you an egg. However, since I'm not playing Diamond and Pearl, I am not going to enjoy an egg today, sorry. The egg that he would give you would hatch into the Pokemon Happini. And I'd like to go over this right now for those that are playing Diamond and Pearl. Happini is the very definition of baggage. To illustrate this, I'm gonna show its base forms, base stats on screen right now. Five attack, five defense, 15 special attack, 30 speed. This is borderline unplayably bad. Not even mentioning the fact that the only attacking move it gets through level up is pound. Yeah, with five attack, pound, seriously. That's not to say that the Happini family is bad whatsoever. We've seen that it's quite good. We saw Cheryl's Chansey earlier and it was a really good wall. But if you want to raise that family, I'd recommend that you pass on Happini. It's a lot better to just catch one of the evolutions down the line, and you're not far off from being able to do that. Chansey is an amazing special wall, and she is the classic rare and hard to catch Pokemon herself. If you want to stall against special attackers, there is no better choice than the Chansey family. Downside is, it gets entirely physical moves by leveling up and it's tied with Happini for the lowest attack stat of any Pokemon. Oh. You're gonna be using TMs if you wanted to do any worthwhile damage and do anything other than stall. The low defense, however, is a necessary weakness. If it's gotta be the best special wall, it's gotta be the worst physical wall. Chansey is tied with Cleffa for being the easiest happiness evolution in the game. We have the Soothe Bell. Would not be hard at all to get Blissey, which is the best special wall in the game. Seriously, go for it if you want it. The Cleffa. This is a high HP tank that can stand up to just about anything, and with the unique ability of Magic Guard, it's immune to many things that other Pokemon aren't. For instance, it's immune to Stealth Rock, but also immune to damage from poison. Any sort of indirect damage is not a problem. It's also tied for having the highest base happiness of anything that evolves through happiness, so it should be pretty easy to evolve. Though its starting moves might make it baggage for a few levels. If you don't want to bother raising Cleffa, but you still want to raise this family, that's okay. The evolution of Cleffa will be available in the not too distant future, but it is harder to find and harder to catch than its baby counterpart. Clefairy. As you would expect, this is just as simple as if you wanted to raise a Clefairy without raising a Cleffa, you can find it here. It is a little bit less baggagey, but it is harder to find. Lower encounter rate and also harder to catch. Simple as that. We have this little boy here that wants a Buizel and he'd be willing to give us a Chatot for it. Chatot is a bit of an oddity. It's a normal flying type special sweeper of all things. It is the only Pokemon capable of learning the move Chatter. This is a 60 power special flying type move with a chance of inflicting confusion. This would be great with a grass type gym coming up and with a lot of Pokemon having poison point as it wouldn't have to worry about that. Problem is though, it learns Chatter at level 21. With the Coal Badge, only Pokemon obtained in trades up to level 20 will obey you. That's kind of a problem, and for that reason, I can't recommend it. I wish I could, it was so close. Even though I can't, it'd be a waste to not mention Chatter and its chance of confusion. You're going to give Chatot a sound for it to remember in battle, and the louder the sound that you put into the DS microphone, the higher the chances of confusion. You could always blow on the mic, but where's the fun in that? The real fun, organic thing to do is to just scream as loud as you can. I sincerely apologize to all the parents that have children that are watching this video that are going to yell into their DS's because I told them to and annoy the crap out of them. <laughs> Pichu! 
It might seem like a completely useless encounter on the surface, as why would you catch a baby Pokemon when you have the evolution right there in the same area? Pichu, however, does have legitimate advantages to raising it over Pikachu. It is able to learn Sweet Kiss, Nasty Plot, and Charm through Level Up. These are all moves that Pikachu is unable to get, and if you want any of those, it might be worth your time fussing with that happiness evolution. On top of that, we did just get a second Soothe Bell, so even if you're already raising a Pokemon that evolves through happiness, it's not going to conflict with your plans as long as you pick that up. It's great. It's up to your discretion, though. There's advantages and disadvantages to both sides. And also advantages and disadvantages to not evolving your Pikachu. You'd think they'd make the mascot Pokemon a lot more simple to raise, but yeah, that's two decisions you'll have to make when raising it. Pikachu! It's a pure electric type, which is always nice. It's very fast, and actually, even though you are seeing the stats of Raichu on screen, there are legitimate advantages to keeping it as just a Pikachu. It has a slim chance of holding a light ball when caught in the wild, which will double the attack and special attack stats if it remains a Pikachu. If you do this, it will be slightly slower and less bulky than Raichu, but it will do more damage. It might be worth considering since Stone Evolutions cease learning moves by level up, and it does get the move Thunderbolt at 26 and Thunder at 45. All nice moves to naturally have if you don't want to spend those TMs. Hoot Hoot is a normal flying type, which might seem pretty generic. Hoot Hoot is anything but generic. It's oddly a special tank, and it learns very different moves from its usual kin. It gets Hypnosis, Reflex, some Psychic type attacks, and I think that this can make it a really good supporter for the team that's able to withstand a few hits while it sets up. If you want good flying type damage, you're not going to find it here though. Noctowl. Every type has its exceptions that challenge the common tropes, and Noctowl doesn't have much speed or attack like most normal flying types do, but rather HP and special stats. While that might seem wacky and random, it learns a lot of moves to support it. It gets Reflect, Confusion, Air Slash, lots of things. Even though I think Staravia is a better Pokemon when talking about the, the general normal flying type, Noctile definitely has its place as a supporter Pokemon on the team. So, after talking to a whopping 32 people underground, which for me, all it did was illustrate how little of a social life I had when I was a kid, and you have slotted the odd keystone into place, you want to check it. You not exactly the most threatening sound when you get right down to it, but it's still a cool sounding cry nonetheless. This is Spiritomb! We have another boss fight here, even though it doesn't play the boss theme. I've always liked to think of it as one. Spiritomb is appealing from the moment you see its type. It has no weakness as of this point in the series. Also has three immunities, normal, fighting, and psychic. What's nice is that if you're just looking for a tank for your team, Spiritomb is basically a free spot. No matter what types you're already using, it won't conflict with any of them. It also has some really solid stats for tanking pretty much anything. The downside, however, is moves. Spiritomb doesn't really... It does get good moves leveling up, but a lot of them are pretty far away. You're going to get Sucker Punch soon after being caught, but that's really all you're going to get for a while, so... Be forewarned that if you want to use this on your team, you can only encounter it at level 25 here, and you might need to stick the experience share on it for some time. The method I've shown here today is the only way to obtain Spiritomb. If you're worried about having to do all that crap just to see it for your Pokedex, don't worry. There is a required battle later on that has a Spiritomb in it. I can tell a lot of you just breathed a sigh of relief hearing that. Gibble. I've been waiting to talk about this one. Only in Platinum, you can obtain Gibble at this point. This is our first Dragon-type Pokémon, and what a wonder it is! Unlike most Dragon Pokémon, it evolves very soon after it's caught, and because of that, you won't have to worry about it falling behind the rest of your team. It has a fantastic type, does huge amounts of damage even from the start, and will pretty much never have a shortage of powerful moves coming in for it to learn. In short, this was banned in tournaments for a reason. You will not be disappointed if you go for it. Gabite. This needs no introduction. It evolves into one of the most fearsome physical sweepers out there. When obtained here, it starts with Slash, Dragon Claw, and Dig, making it at least decent from the moment that it joins you. You're unlikely to see it evolve before the end of the story without hefty grinding, so it might be worth passing on if you don't plan to go on after that. Catching it on the basement floor, it's level 43 instead of 41 late game, so yeah, that might be worth it because two levels this late on is pretty huge. Munchlax, and you will not be catching it, trust me on this. If you are lucky enough to obtain it, 
Munchlax is one happiness evolution away from getting you a Snorlax, which is one of those powerful Pokemon ever to exist. Offensively a beast, unstoppable bulk, normal type, so it's capable of learning tons of moves, it's great. The reason why you won't be obtaining it is that Munchlax can only appear on four honey trees in the entire game. And these are randomly generated with every playthrough. And there is no way of knowing in-game which four they are for your playthrough. And as if all that's not bad enough, even if you did somehow slather honey on the one of the four trees that can possibly spawn it, you can only get an encounter once every few hours, and Munchlax is a 1% encounter rate! There are no other ways to obtain Munchlax or Snorlax in Diamond Pearl Platinum without transferring in from another game. And in my opinion, obtaining Munchlax in this game is the hardest to obtain legitimately available Pokemon without transferring. It's that hard to find. I have never once done it, nor have I ever met anyone who has. But maybe you have. Maybe you'll get lucky. And if you do, feel blessed, because it's what you are. You'll have gotten a very sweet reward for Unknown. In pretty much every piece of Pokemon-related media that is not the video games, Unknown is always portrayed as being this mega-powerful, legendary Pokemon of incredible destruction, and I don't know why. Unknown is arguably the worst of all Pokemon in existence. No stat over 72, it never evolves so that never gets better, and it only ever learns one move, Hidden Power. For those that don't know, Hidden Power is a move that is different for every individual Pokemon that is taught it. It's based on individual values, so it can be any power between 30 and 70, and ironically, with it being listed as a normal type move in the in-game menus, it can be any type except normal. In fact, if you want to know why Unknown is such a spectacular fail in this game in particular, the fact that it can only learn Hidden Power, which is now always special thanks to the physical special split, it can never use its 72 attack stat no matter what anymore. That's a leftover from back when Hidden Power could be physical. So, yeah, that's a spectacular fail if I ever saw one. Riolu, oh man. If you can bear to stay awake during the daylight hours to make it evolve, Riolu is awesome! You can look forward to counter at only level 6 and force palm at level 11. Not that you'd want to fight at that low of a level, but it at least has good moves to start out. If you can get it to evolve, Lucario is a fantastic steel fighting type mixed attacker. As for what level I suggest evolving it at, you really don't have to care all that much. Heart scales will let you reteach anything you miss, but if you don't want to use them, it gets Bone Rush at level 19, which is alright, it gets Swords Dance at 33, so in addition to being powerful, it's a forgiving evolution. What I don't get about Lucario, though, is that everyone knows these are the Aura Pokémon. Which, honestly, as someone who follows all the Pokémon canons, the word Aura just means whatever the hell the writers want it to mean at any given moment, and they never say what it actually means. In the real world, it's just atmosphere generated by a living thing, but in Pokémon, lasers shot from your hands, orbs of energy, power that causes you to lose your mind, spidey sense, or whatever the heck ability to cheat death. It's the Pokémon equivalent of the word alchemy. Asian pop culture would have you thinking that alchemy means mega powerful magic and shooting lightning bolts and stuff, when really, it's just idiots in the Dark Ages that thought they could take a pair of tweezers to a lead atom and turn it into a gold atom. Self, Wooper. With its great water ground type, learning earthquake through leveling up, and decent bulk, it's pretty good. Just don't catch it here if you want one. Reason being is that you can find its evolved form Quagsire in the very next route, which is available to you right now. So, there's no need to pull your hair out over finding into the Safari Zone. Its evolved form Quagsire can also be found here, which, same as before, not a bad Pokemon, just don't catch it here. Oh, I somehow managed to think that Wingle was first on a later route, but here it is right in front of me, so I guess I'm going over it now. Look at it as a blessing in disguise in the form of a majestic seagull flying over the sunset. <laughs> I can't explain why, but the water flying type, even though I know it's good, Sounds really tough on Gyarados, but it just never sounds like a good type on the Wingle family for me. It's weird. I know that they're fairly bulky, but I don't get it. Um, Wingle can make a good HM user between Fly and Defog, and it's also a water type, so there's that. Um, 
If you want to actually raise Wingle, Helper has decent enough bulk and it can stand up to most physical attackers even without a type advantage. Water and Flying aren't bad offensive types, but its ability doesn't really do it many favors. I wish it had a better ability. If it just had something better than that, I feel like it would be a much more used Pokemon than it is. With a whopping 1% encounter rate, you can encounter Pelipper here. If you wanted to raise Wingle and you want to skip the evolution and you have lottery levels of luck, you can catch it here. It seriously becomes more common in a later area. I wouldn't recommend grinding it out. It has decent enough bulk and it can stand up to physical attackers even without a type advantage in most cases, but its ability doesn't really do it many favors. Again, I wish it had something better. Giraffarig. I like its type, only weak to bug and dark. That's about where the positives end. It has very average stats and its level up moves are weird. Uh, it only gives you psychic type moves to use with that special attack stat. Everything else it learns naturally is physical. So you're gonna be using some TMs on this one. I don't mean to make it sound horrible. It can definitely be a mixed attacker. It's just not great. Um, Ruin Maniac Cave. When I say it out loud, it really sounds like a place where 10 year olds should not be poking around. TM28 Dig is right here. Speaking of moves like Fly that I probably won't be using because they take a turn to charge up, we have this. You take double damage from Earthquake while you're underground. And um, there is yet another new encounter in this cave. This is the only place that you can find Hippopotas in the entire game. It's very solid at using physical attacks and taking them. It also learns Earthquake leveling up and is generally pretty helpful because of that. While it's solid in stats and moves, it can be a little tough to use due to its ability. Sandstream in Generation 4 does not ever end unless it is overwritten by another weather effect. So unless your entire team is rock, ground, and steel, you're taking damage after switching or you're gonna need to have another weather move to cancel it out. I've used one before and it's not impossible to deal with, it just really stings. When you use Hippopotas early in a battle and then later in the same fight, your own Sandstorm is the thing to knock out one of your own Pokemon or it's the deciding factor in you losing a fight. It does happen. Also, some people might get annoyed at looking at that Sandstorm animation every turn of every battle that Hippopotas is in. Consider turning off battle animations, it might save your sanity. Pipowdon, the fully evolved Sandstorm Summoner is here. Everything we said a long time ago about Hippopotas still stands. It's good at what it does, but it might be tough to fit it in if you're not going for a Sandstorm team. And really, why would you wait this late to get the centerpiece of a Sandstorm team? Azuril. No reason to catch this at all unless you're going for a full Pokedex and you don't want to have to breed for it. And even then, why would you ever choose going to the Safari Zone? over just breeding for something. We've been able to get decently high level Merrells for this point in the game for a long time now, so you really have no reason to get this weak baby Pokemon, unless you want to see the miracle of it growing a dick. <laughs> but seriously, we have Merrill. With huge power, the physical special split, and a level 18 evolution, Merrill is good to go right off the bat. Can only be found this early in Platinum. Only thing that's kind of a shame is that it doesn't get Aqua Jet except through breeding in this game. The reason why I bring this up is that if this were any later game in the series, it would naturally have it as soon as we would catch it at these levels. Unfortunately, it might not be the best Pokemon long term if you're not willing to shell it for some TMs or breed, but it's a great short term water type due to its high stats at a low level. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up in Meryl's bio, but Meryl's pre-evolution of Azuril is the only time in any evolutionary family of Pokemon where it has a different gender ratio. Because of this, one third of all female Azurals, when they evolve into Meryl, grow a dick. <laughs> that really is it. Azumarill. Unfortunately, as much as I'd love to recommend Azumarill, a lot of its better moves are locked behind breeding in this game. This wouldn't be such a problem, but it comes in so late in the adventure that if you've wanted a physical attacking water type, you're either already a happy Floatzel trainer or you caught a Meryl a while back. Its stats are definitely all right. It's good, it has that huge power to make up for the fact that its attack stat's not really all that great. It gets double edge upon being caught and gets Aqua Tail at 47 if you're still interested. But yeah, it's not bad. It just comes in a little bit too late to be useful. It is Skaroopy. This starts off as a poison bug type, but will eventually become a dark poison type. Yeah, that same frustrating type we saw in Jupiter's Skun Tank, only weak to ground. 
This Pokemon can be interesting to say the least. It's an odd mix of speed and defense with a little bit of attack thrown in. Not really something that you see that often. And in the way of type coverage, it gets access to Bug Bite through level up. Of course, it's got its poison type moves, which, you know, those aren't really the greatest for type coverage. But the real kicker is that when it evolves into Drapion, you are able to get all three of the elemental Fang moves through Heart Scales. Definitely opens up a lot in the way of type coverage if you want to bother with the Safari Zone rules in order to get it. Krogunk. It seems almost blasphemous to imagine these things not in Pastoria City, but sure enough, it is one of these. This can be kind of a fun Pokemon. It can use many different moves well. It's poison and fighting, which gives it decent enough type coverage, and it can learn some good dark type moves like Sucker Punch. It evolves a little bit later than I would have liked, but it's not bad. Um, I would definitely recommend Dry Skin over Anticipation. And also, I would not catch it here if you are playing Platinum. I am so sorry, Diamond and Pearl players, but us Platinumites... Platinumites, I, I, I don't know. But we can... The, the point is, we can go right outside Pastoria into the next route and catch it without dealing any of the Safari Zone's crap. Carnivine! Levitate! On a grass type. It's random, it doesn't really help it that much, and it makes no sense, but that's kind of why I like it so much. It's just really out there. Um, seriously though, aside from personal preference, it, it's got surprisingly solid offensive stats both ways. It learns some good moves like Crunch, Ring Out, and Power Whip. Problem is, they come at pretty late levels. It also only appears in the Great Marsh, so if the Safari Zone rules give you a headache and you just really don't want to bother with them, I can already tell you're going to pass on this. Now, the Pokedex entry, if we may end on a little bit of a different note, this thing is creepy. It has sweet-smelling saliva and chomps down on whatever comes near, swallowing it whole. Yeah, I get that it's supposed to be basically the same thing as a Venus flytrap, but this thing is almost five feet tall! What the heck? Remoraid! This is a weird Pokemon. How it goes from fish to octopus, I will never understand. It's definitely one of the standout evolution chains out there. If you want to raise it, it's decently useful. It has equal attack and special attack when fully evolved. And Octillery, its evolved form, has the unique attack of Octazooka, but it's honestly pretty weak. It lowers accuracy, it's water type, it's basically a worse muddy water. I guess as a fun fact, Remoraid is based on the Gunfish enemy from Pulse Man, another game that Game Freak worked on. If you've never played it, definitely do. It's on Virtual Console, and if I could describe it in short terms, it's basically Plasma Kirby plus Mega Man. Heck, Octillery! Octillery is how you say... Awkward. <laughs> it's a mixed attacker with poor speed and average defenses. As of this point, you've had the opportunity to get plenty of better water types. You could also have gotten Remoraid if you wanted to raise this sooner. The level range for its encounters with the Super Rod is huge, so I'm not gonna bother with moves that it'll have as soon as you catch it. It will learn some pretty good stuff, though. Gets Bullet Seed, Signal Beam, and Ice Beam through level up. Only other thing worth noting is that Octillery does have a signature move called Octazooka. It's a low power, slightly inaccurate water type move that can lower opponent's accuracy. Much like Octillery, it's awkward as well. Finneon! Do you remember that this thing exists most of the time? Well, with such gems of starting moves as Pound, Water Gun, and Gust, it's no wonder it often goes forgotten. Okay, seriously. It does learn Water Pulse soon after you catch it, just like Barboach. But it has such a horrible move pool, such low total stats, and just, it's the epitome of outclassed. There are so many other water types that do the exact same thing, only better. It's just... There's not any real reason for it to exist. We've had better water types for a while now. I guess it's evolution's cool looking at least. Um, using the good rod, you can now catch Luminion. That name is fun to say, but it's nothing special. Stats are low, move pool is as shallow as the unconvincing square pond that you catch it in. Look elsewhere. It's a shame. It's so pretty. And as a commentator, it'd be so fun to say its name every time I send it out. It really would. I like Tentacool and I am not afraid to admit it. Yeah, that thing that you run into everywhere you can surf and it's every dang encounter on those routes. I actually kind of like. Its type is decent defensively, has some useful resistances. It has some good bulk against special attacks, which is not really all that common in the Sinnoh decks in particular. And it can be encountered at some really diverse levels, so it can be pretty high level as soon as you catch it. 
You wouldn't expect something so common to be useful, but again, it kind of is. I sound like I'm just repeating myself with Zubat here. As a side note, every single root in all of Sinnoh that has Tentacool on it also has Tentacruel on it. So if you're thinking of adding this to your team, you need to only ask yourself, am I willing to hold out for a rarer encounter? But the answer is yes. Down here, there is a stone that did not have the lighting effects in this room applied to it. And it's not even a hidden item, so you can't even make that excuse of, hey, it was meant to stand out. There is a single new encounter that you can get down here, and I want to see if maybe I can get a little lucky with running into it. Going to uh, register my good rod. There you are. I think I scrolled past it twice, actually. The new encounter I want to talk about is the Pokemon Feebas. Before going over Feebas as an option for your team whatsoever, I need to talk about its sheer rarity. If you've never played this game before, I'm sure you're kind of going like, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure maybe it's got like a low encounter rate or something, or you have to have like a really good fishing rod to be able to catch it or whatever, right? Phoebus has a 50% encounter rate no matter what rod you use. On only four random tiles in this entire basement floor of Mount Coronet, randomly generated every new playthrough. It is one of the rarest Pokemon in existence at this point in the series, and it can be a real pain to catch if you want to add it to your caught Pokedex. However, there is a way around this, and it's actually really nice. Mixing records. Only in Generation 4. After mixing records, everyone's Feebas and counter tiles will be synced to that of Player 1 in the record mixing. Meaning that, say, if anybody that I did multiplayer stuff with so far in the series were to go and check their Feebas spots, if I were to happen to find one, they could see this video and go find one for themselves. It's a nice feature of mixing records. For a game where record mixing feels so pointless and like such a dumb addition because it really doesn't do much of anything, it's kind of great that there's that one super rare Pokemon that you can all collaborate together in order to find. It's a really neat experience. It's something you don't really get to do much in Pokemon games where you can all work as a team to locate where this super rare thing is and then share that information with one another. Or maybe you can each take a corner of the map to cut down on how much time it's going to take. I mean, you can mix records up to four other people at the same time, so it's not like you can't like divide it up into, well, okay, not quarters, but fifths, but still, when you're talking about a square pond, I would kind of think quarters would be the way to go, just saying. Yeah, Phoebus is interesting to say the least. And that is even more so in what kind of Pokemon it is. It is a Magikarp clone, only knowing Splash, Tackle, and Flail until it evolves. Of course it's gonna suck in its base form. And evolving it is weird as well. It is to date the only Pokemon that evolves based on contest stats. It needs to have at least 170 beauty and then be leveled up. This might sound intimidating at first if you're not really good at making Povins, but again, if you can work together with your friends and make Povins in multiplayer, or better yet, just get some really good berries. You can get Pam Tree Berries, no problem at all, from the guy in Amity Square, five at a time, no less. It's not really all that bad when you think about it that way. When it evolves into Milotic, it gains the ability Marvel Scale, which will double its defense if it's suffering from a status condition. Think of it like the defensive equivalent of Guts. Milotic can function as a tank, it can function as a special attacker, and all in all, it's pretty solid in what it does both ways. The only real downside to it that I would personally be able to say is that for multiplayer, its move pool is a bit on the shallow side. It's very predictable what moves just about every Milotic is going to have in multiplayer, so you're not about to catch your opponent off guard with it. But hey, if you're incredibly lucky and you manage to find one of these things, perhaps it'll be offset by just how good its stats are. Mantike, the only Pokemon fusion in the entire series, a very unique Pokemon. It must level up with a Remoraid in the party in order to become Mantine. It's worth noting that every wild Pokemon on this route can be encountered as high as level 50. Personally, I'm a big fan of Tentacruel and I'd recommend that if you can find it at level 50, but this is Mantike's bio, I'm getting sidetracked. Due to the possible level encounters, it's very feasible to get Hydra Pump on Mantike at level 49. Its biggest stat by far is special defense and it can definitely take some hits once it's evolved. Heck. Even before it's evolved, I would hardly describe it as frail. And that water flying type can be a bit awkward for some teams to deal with, so it might be useful for that alone if you have a spot for it on your team this late. 
Other than that, there's not a whole lot more to say about it other than using a heart scale can get some fun moves on it, like Signal Beam, but this is Sinnoh. I'm sure you know by this point how valuable those heart scales are, what a wonderful mechanic they can be, and if not them, then those shards that give you those move tutor moves. And the last new encounter, Snover. All hail the Hail Summoner we were waiting for since Gen 3! Okay, no, seriously. It was a little bit odd that this didn't exist sooner. It has the nice advantage of 100% accurate Blizzard without a turn of setup. It also gets Wood Hammer at level 35. It is not lacking in powerful attacking moves. Fun fact, Blizzard in Hail, only in Diamond and Pearl, could hit through Protect and Detect 30% of the time. That's pretty amazing. And I'm very glad that they patched that out because that's really ridiculous as well. The problem with Snow Run, however, is its type. Snover has seven. That's seven weaknesses, including a quad weakness to fire. Plus it's slow and often going to get attacked first. Hail also only nerfs one attacking move in the entire game, Solar Beam. It's not like Rain where you nerf all fire type moves, no. Hail just simply doesn't do that and it really stinks for a Pokemon with this many common weaknesses. Due to it showing up so late in the adventure, it might be hard to fit into your team because of how much overlap its weaknesses might have with other members of your team that you've already picked. The name of the game is using powerful but accurate moves with this one. Obama Snow! Aside from the incredibly fun name, I feel like I'm just repeating myself here because I don't really have much else to say about it that I didn't talk about with Snover. Access to good level up moves, but Hail just isn't the most useful weather effect out there. Really only useful to ice types, and it's just not as versatile as, say, Sandstorm, and ice really isn't that good of a type. Plus, it has seven weaknesses, including a quad weakness to fire. Tough to use, but if you wanted to use a pure ice type team for sake of personal challenge or something, it's definitely worth considering for that, I guess. Sneasel! This is outright one of the absolute best options for a physical sweeper you have accessible to you in the Platinum single player. Not only did Sneasel get a much needed evolution with some killer stats, outspeeding dang near everything, but also, in more recent games, Ice Punch is a bit of an elusive move to get on Sneasel unless you do some breeding and stuff like that. Not so in Platinum. In Platinum, there's that move tutor near Pastoria City who will teach it for just a few shards. The only downsides of Sneasel that I'd really say are that that Razor Claw needed for evolution is at the very end of our journey, and if you wanted to put Pursuit on it, you're not gonna be able to do that without breeding. So it might be a bit of an uphill battle, oh, but he's so good otherwise. Here we are at Acuity Cavern. Once again, as always, you wanna save. Yuxi, the being of knowledge, is meant to be a dual wall, having both respectable defense and special defense, though with not the greatest HP stat in the world. Unlike most walls, it has a respectable speed stat of 95, not something you really see that often in that combination. Um, it is mainly about getting off various effects before the enemy can really do anything about them and using those in order to wall. It does get both Reflect and Light Screen through TM, and you can buy both of those in the Veilstone Department Store, making it a really good defensive Pokemon. Think of this as a Pokemon that redefines Psychic types. Even though bulky Psychic types are fairly common nowadays, this was back in Gen 4 when that sort of thing really was not common. It wouldn't be until Gen 5 I'd say that there were other Pokemon like Yuxi out there, and even then, they're not really known for their speed, I'll say that much. So what you want to do is have a Pokemon that is lower level than it, hopefully higher level than everything else that normally appears in the area, cast up a repel, and run around. Mesprit, the being of emotion, is that one Pokemon that seems to be in every trio. The one that is not offensive, not defensive, but a hybrid of whatever the other two are and it doesn't stand out as much as the other late guardians because of this. It doesn't have horrible stats by any means, but Yuxi and his elf just perform better at one thing rather than just simply being okay at both things. It also doesn't help that by level up moves, very little of what it learns is all that good. It is gonna be attacking with Swift, Future Sight, and Extra Sensory unless you use a TM. And if you wanna have a powerful user of that Psychic TM, you might as well just use his elf. Mesprit, 
I'm sorry. It's not that I don't like you. I think you are an incredibly charming Pokemon, and you've had some sweet moments in the story up to this point. But you just don't stand out that much in battle. If you want something that Mesprit is definitely first place in, in my opinion, that portrait in its bio that we're seeing right now is definitely first place out of the three. Because, man, I laughed when I saw this picture for the first time. I like it a lot. We go into this cave, and we have some familiar music. And a familiar face. We want to save before going any further, I will just say that much. Azelf, the being of willpower, has earned its title. 125 attack, 125 special attack, complemented oh so nicely with 115 speed. It is a mix sweeper in its purest form. What more could you ask for? I guess moves, but Azelf's got you covered there too. It's got nasty plot in its starting moveset, which is awesome. Has swift in its starting moveset, which is all right, I suppose. It gets explosion through level up at level 76, which might be out of the question for the time being for a lot of people that would want to use this, but it also gets tons of great moves on both the physical and special fronts through TMs. But that brings me to probably the only disappointing thing about Izelf whatsoever. No psychic unless topped by TM. It is really disappointing that it doesn't have it by level up, but to be fair, if it had to be bad at anything, that's not very big compared to everything else. There had to be at least something that was kind of unfortunate. There is one encounter that shines above the rest. You can try battling all the trainers in Sinnoh, you could try never using any repel so you run to everything in the wild, and you will never see this unless you check this book. Manaphy. An extremely rare Pokemon that has never been seen, let alone captured. In Sinnoh. Those Pokemon rangers in their regions find them all the time. There it is! It has been registered in your Pokedex! Manaphy is our very first legendary Pokemon that is not ambiguous in any way! It's outright a legendary! It has the awesome ability of hydration! As if it wasn't already good enough in having its water moves boosted by rain, it also has that ability. It is one of only two Pokemon, the other being Volbeat, that can learn Tail Glow, the special counterpart of Swords Dance. But if you don't want to buff your own stats, that's okay. You can always steal the buffs of your opponent with its signature move, Heart Swap. Too bad you won't be obtaining it. Manaphy is, in my opinion, the rarest Pokemon as of 2016, or rather as of the point of this being recorded. You can only find it one of two ways. One is by doing a Wi-Fi event in Pokemon Ranger 2 or 3 that is no longer going on as the service has been shut down, so that's out the window. The other way of legitimately obtaining it is to get a cartridge of the original Pokemon Ranger, finish the game, input a code that was given out on Pokemon.com quite a few years ago, which you can still find if you do a little bit of digging, but the real kicker is that mana fee distribution for that is once per cartridge. Not once per save file, per cartridge. So, good luck finding a used copy of Pokemon Ranger that hasn't already had its mana fee redeemed by some person that has owned it in the past. Cause, yeah, that is the only way you can still get it. Thanks. Right here. You wanna save your game. Only if you come here at night. Inside the TV, there appears to be a Pokemon. Pokemon appears as if it will come out to thump the TV. We thump the TV set, and we have a boss fight! This is Rotom, the only one of its kind. If you want to see this for your Pokedex, you have to come to the old chateau at night. No two ways about it. Rotom was level 15 in Diamond and Pearl, been up to 20 here in Platinum, so it's gotten a bit of a buff, can be immediately usable. If you want to catch it, it is one of the harder Pokemon to catch that we've seen so far, so come prepared. It's a decent enough attacking Pokemon, has some pretty good special attack and some speed. It's type together with its ability is really nice. It's the only electric ghost type in the entire game. And the fact that it has Levitate getting rid of Electric's only weakness means that it's only a benefit to it to have that electric subtype. Really nice. In terms of stats, it's definitely not the finest Pokemon out there. There's faster electric types, there's faster ghost types, sure. But the type combination together with its ability and just the type coverage that you get from Electric and Ghost-type moves 
If there's one word that I can use to describe Rodom, it's fun. There is a bit of a secret that this building holds. If you go to Jubilife TV and you talk to the man that lets you tell him two phrases, you want to say everyone happy and Wi-Fi connection. Doing that will open Mystery Gift. This will allow you to download various events over Nintendo Wi-Fi connection, or at least it did back when that still existed. On certain dates, you could get a wonder card that would give you the secret key item. If you have this, this doorway will open up on the first floor of the Eterna Galactic building. Go inside it and you'll see that there are five appliances laid out for you on the floor. This is not the electronic section of an overpriced apartment store, but instead, if you remember back to Rotom's Pokedex entry, it mentions that it can possess the motors and various electronics and take control of them. That's what you can do here. Rotom has access to five new forms here, all giving it those higher stats that you see on screen right now. If you have Rotom take control of the oven, it will get overheat. The washing machine gives it hydro pump. Refrigerator gives blizzard. Fan gets air slash. And the mower gives leaf storm. However, it can only have one of these moves at a time. These forms are also only in platinum version. Rotom will remain an electric ghost type no matter what form you take. So it doesn't get those type changes that it gets in later games with these forms. And the last of the many stipulations is that these forms are locked only to single player. In fourth gen, you cannot bring them into multiplayer whatsoever because they did not exist in Diamond and Pearl. It sounds more like a license agreement than a Pokemon when I list all those stipulations one after another, but trust me, it is a very solid Pokemon. My personal favorites are Wash and Mo for single player and Wash and Heat for multiplayer. All very good forms. The others are no slouches though. This is Gligar. This one struggled to stand out a lot historically. It had a good type with only two weaknesses and some really solid defense, but it just didn't learn many good moves and it could have done with an evolution. Gen 4 delivered. It is very much worth considering now due to its evolution that can take hits and dish out huge amounts of damage. Plus, it got so many new moves such as U-Turn, Night Slash, and quite frankly, more TMs being compatible than it knows what to do with giving it amazing type coverage. Just make sure that you evolve it by level 31 because you'll miss out on Night Slash if you don't. Also, the Razor Fang that it needs for evolution is accessible during the main story, but it's a hidden item. I'll be showing where it is when the time comes, but just know that it's not easily found. Other than how it does in battle, this Pokemon is complete nonsense. How does it fly being three feet tall and weighing that darn much? What? Nosepass desperately needed an evolution, and it got one in Sinnoh. If you choose to go for it, you can evolve it immediately by leveling it up in Mount Coronet, the very area you catch it in. It has absolutely beastly defense, and will become Rock Steel type when it evolves. Very little will be able to stand up to it early on if you choose to evolve it right this second. But be warned that Sturdy is not buffed yet like it was in Gen 5, and it also does not learn Thunder Wave almost immediately like it does in other games. The Ralts, who became a split evolution in this game. I'll talk about each option, but let's go over Ralts itself first. It is much higher leveled in the wild than it was in Ruby, Sapphire, Emerald. For that reason, it is no longer a painful grind of it only knowing Growl when you catch it. It's a lot more viable to start off. Also helps that it's about to evolve at the levels that you catch it here. As for evolve forms, female Ralts can only ultimately become Gardevoir. This gives it some respectable special attack and special defense, furthering the abilities that it has as a Ralts. Just keep in mind that one, it's not a fairy type in this game, so that does not exist. And two, it's not as powerful as some other special psychic types like Alakazam. This is trading some of its power in return for bulk. Male Ralts, on the other hand, have it much better. They have the option to become either Gardevoir or Gallade. Gallade is essentially a physical Gardevoir with more learnable moves and a fighting type. There are many, many good moves that this can learn, and multiple viable movesets for both single player and multiplayer. It has that deep of a move pool. Downside is, it requires a stone for evolution that we can't just simply go underground and dig up. You're gonna be waiting a little bit for it, but you're waiting a while to get Gardevoir as well. You can wait a little bit for Gallade if you want to use it. In short, I can highly recommend Ralts in either of its final evolutions. Both are great in their own right. Lickitung! This bulky normal type was nothing special for a while, but like many other Pokemon, Gen 4 changed that. 
It gained a much needed evolution in Licky Licky, which you'll need to roll out to obtain. It learns it at level 33 if you're curious about that. It's not the greatest normal type out there, but it can take hits, and I personally really like this family for a weird reason we'll be seeing later. Trust me on this, it's very me, but anyway. What it has to offer for us. Let's start off strong by going to this house next to the Pokemon Center, because it's really good. Hiya! Oh, you're a trainer. That means you're using Pokemon boxes. I love meeting end users. Oh, what's up? Why that astonished look? Oh, right, sorry, there I go running my mouth again. My name is Bebe. You know that, you know the po PC boxes? I'm the system administrator. I know this is out of the blue, but do you want a Pokemon named Eevee? I'm not gonna be raising one on my team this time, even though I have many times before, but sure I do. If you wanna see this for your Pokedex, nice easy place to get it. Easy Eevee. <laughs> so she got this from a friend in Johto who has a lot of them. She's friends with him and she's a PC administrator. I wonder who she could be talking about. Well, whoever he is, I sure hope he pays his bills on time because that suck of the PC system went offline. We will be very good at this Eevee, even though it's not gonna be on our team. So, Eevee is a Pokemon that is now capable of evolving into seven different evolved forms. Seriously, just look at how tiny the space is that's reserved for the art. I laughed when we plugged in all of its data into the bio. <laughs> okay. We can't get quite all of its evolutions yet, but we can get most of them. And I think we can go over them right now. Besides, we just got Rolf last time, it hasn't gotten a chance to fight yet. I think it could do well with some training. There's a lot of trainers that we haven't fought around here yet, and we also got the Versus Seeker, so I say we do a training montage while we go over these. As a preface to these evolutions, one thing you should know is that they each learn a good move that complements them at level 15, and then again at level 36. Eevee joins us at level 20, unfortunately, meaning that you are going to miss out on that first move for at least a while, and it might be more difficult to raise than in other Pokemon games because of it. First, with a Water Stone, Eevee can become Vaporeon. It's bulky, it's a water type, and it even has a water immunity now. This is one of those tried and true Pokemon that have withstood the test of time and is still great today despite all the changes made to the game. It's gonna have no good moves for a while though. Water Gun is that level 15 move, which Eevee is already gonna be passed, and its next attacking moves are all physical until you get Aurora Beam at level 36. You might wanna wait on adding it to your team if you want one, because we don't have a single water type TM or HM yet, and that's where Vaporeon's gonna get some of its better moves for. It's good, you just might wanna wait on it for a little bit. With a Thunderstone, you can get Jolteon, another well-aging Pokemon. Tied for the fastest in the Sinnoh decks with my beloved Crobat. You're gonna be going first and doing good damage in nearly every fight, and it's not even as gimped by that whole level up move thing like Vaporeon is. We have a far more TMs that are compatible with Jolteon at this point in time than we do with Vaporeon. And with a Firestone, you can get Flareon, I guess. I feel so bad for this thing. Out of the original trilogy of Eevees, this is easily the worst one. Awesome attack stat, nothing to use it with. It gets Fire Fang in this game, making it slightly less terrible than in previous games, but you wanna know when it learns that? Cause I know when it learns that, I know it by heart. Level 43. If you're really determined, it learns Iron Tail by TM eventually whenever we get that. Yeah, don't go for this unless you want a nice looking Pokemon, cause it really is cool looking and that's about it. I feel so awful for it. I look at Flareon, and I see so much potential. They just don't give it the capability to use that potential. It's... Uh, maybe another time in another game, I can say good things about it, but Flareon, I feel so bad giving you a bad review every game. I really don't want to. On a brighter note, because it's a happiness evolution in the daytime, you can get Espeon! We're getting into some pretty good EV evolutions available to us right now. Espeon is your high damaging psychic type Pokemon. Problem is that it's missed out on confusion already and it's only gonna have physical moves until it gets Psybeam at level 36. We also don't have that many TMs that it can learn. It's a happiness evolution, so you might not have to worry about it having poor moves for an Espeon because it will be an Eevee for a while but it might make it challenging to raise until it gets a little higher level. Happiness at nighttime gets you Umbreon, the tank of the Eevee evolutions, and a bit of a weird one. 
It's by no means a bad Pokemon. It's very resilient, does well with moves that whittle down the opponent. But it, for single player, it might be a little too slow for some people. It's very much strictly a wall and it won't do much damage, but if that's what you want, it's one of the best defensive Pokemon in the Sinnoh decks. It's also worth considering if you want a good wall, but Bronzor was a little bit too much of a wall for you and just wasn't flexible in being able to do other things. And last, we have a new method of evolution. If you remember that mossy rock in Eterna Forest, if you take Eevee there and level it up in the patch of grass around that rock, you can get Leafeon, the latest member of the Flareon Club. Okay, Leafeon does have a few positives. Good defense, good attack, pretty good speed for grass type standards. Problem is that pure grass type isn't very good defensively for what it's trying to be, and oh sweet Gardenia, this thing got screwed in the moves that are accessible to it. I know what you're thinking. Can't be that bad, right? You know, I bet it gets some good stuff. I bet it gets Leaf Blade. Level 71. Swords Dance, 78 and only in Platinum. Baton Pass, keep it unevolved as an Eevee until level 36. X Scissor, TM only. Until level 71 when you get Leaf Blade. The best grass move to complement its stats as in a physical grass move. Are you ready for this? Razor Leaf. I know Razor Leaf is working out well on my Grodel, but that's until level 71. And a lot of the other moves that Leafeon can get via other means aren't available during the main story. Just like Flareon, I did not want to give Leafeon a negative review. I think it's cute, and in later games, I think it's very underrated because they fix its level up moves in later games. But until then, it's true to its name. It's a Leaf, and it's that way for an Eon. It's... Ugh. And as for Glaceon, like I said, we can't get it yet, so I think we're gonna be saving that for later. Even though we encountered Eevee all that time ago, this is now the earliest opportunity we have had to obtain its new Ice-type evolution, Glaceon. As much as I hate to say it, this is probably the second worst Eevee evolution. Pure Ice-type is not the greatest start, and when in one of the stats it specializes in his defense, that's kind of a bad combination. Much like Leafeon, its level up moves are horrible. It never learns Ice Beam leveling up and doesn't get Blizzard until level 71. You're using TMs on this one if you want to take advantage of that special attack stat. Not that it's impossible to use, I don't mean to make it sound like it's as bad as Flareon, not by a long shot, but it is a little bit tough. Swablu. This normal flying type Pokemon will become a dragon flying type Pokemon that's tanky of all things. Not really what you'd expect at first glance. It learns some good support moves and whatnot, but its level up moves aren't really all that exciting. It does get takedown one level after it's caught in this route, but I thought I would let you know that its level up moves aren't spectacular for a little while after it's caught. Other than that, does its job fine. What? What? Are you kidding me? Like, already? I thought that was gonna be like two or three episodes from now. I didn't think that it would hatch that fast. I mean, I've been doing a little bit of exploring this video, but damn, well, I guess no time like the present to go over Togepi. This really is the episode of Pokemon that are like, hey, if you were playing Diamond and Pearl, it'd be like another 20 hours until you catch me, but nope, you're playing Platinum, so you can get me right now. That's what Togepi is. This egg is the only way to obtain it during the main story. It's gonna be a rough road raising it. Baby Pokemon hatched from eggs are only level 1 in Diamond Pearl Platinum as opposed to level 5 in previous games. It gets no attacking moves for a long, long time. It doesn't get much better in the way of level up moves until it evolves when that is rough because it's a happiness evolution. If you can tough through all that, Togekiss is a beast! has great defenses, great special attack, and like any good normal type, learns many, many great moves. Because of the rich move pool, I think Serene Grace is the better of its two abilities. Houndour! At the levels it appears on this route, it will immediately evolve into Houndoom after just one level. That's a bit contradictory now that I say it out loud when I say immediately and then after one level, but I digress. It's a respectable special attacker out of the gate because of that. My only complaint with the Houndour family is, in this particular game, I kinda wish it were just a fire type and not a fire dark type. Don't get me wrong, it does get a psychic immunity and the dark and ghost resistances from that, but in terms of special dark type moves, the only one it gets is Dark Pulse. 
This would be fine if it just weren't only through TM. Other than that, it can work as a special attacker, it can work as a mixed attacker. I even considered using this on my team for a little while, and I definitely think it's a good Pokemon. I just wasn't sure if it had a place on my particular team. I know that I could use another special attacker, but I have another idea for that that I think better fits in on this team. You'll see. Magnemite! This is encountered anywhere from levels 28 to 30, and it evolves into Magneton at level 30. In addition to that, it evolves into Magnezone if leveled up one time in Mount Coronet. You can get this fully evolved almost instantly out of the box. It's great. As a Magnezone, it can be taught Mirror Coat through a Heart Scale, which is definitely worth noting. Um, has a really high special attack, is pretty bulky, Steel type of course gives it a lot of nice resistances. But if I had one criticism of the Magnemite family, it's that especially as Magnezone, a lot of its good level up moves come super late. So I would suggest if you want to raise this, we did just get a TM24 Thunderbolt at Valley Windworks and you can buy more of those at the game corner, consider using that. Magneton! We've already gone over the stats of this with Magnemite, does lots of damage, can take some damage, and it has a great defensive type. It's a rare encounter, but if it's found, it's rewarding. Always level 41, starts with Discharge, and it will soon get Mirror Shot. Magnezone is also immediately available, because we can go to Mount Coronet and go to high level areas to easily grind out a level. Though I will warn you, Electric and Steel type moves are not going to be super helpful for the remainder of our adventure. Also, while Discharge is decent, if you want Thunderbolt, you're using a TM. Feels like I say that a lot. Stangela. It's the original pure grass type Pokemon, which used to not really be all that good, but once again, this has changed due to Gen 4 delivering and giving it a much needed bulky evolution. You'll need Ancient Power to evolve it, which is learned at level 38, but unfortunately, as much as I kind of like Tangrowth as a Pokemon for multiplayer and whatnot, I'm not sure I'd recommend it for single player. There's a few reasons for this. It doesn't get very many good moves until really high levels. There is also the fact that, of course, Grass just really isn't the best tanking type out there, which that's just kind of up to how you use it if you can make the most of that. But then the last reason is just you can only ever catch it in the Safari Zone, and that's just kind of an added pain on top of everything else. I wouldn't say that it's a horrible Pokemon by any means, but I will say that you are going to have a little bit of a tough time. Yanma. You were generic, weak, and had pretty much zero redeeming qualities when you were introduced. But man, how times have changed. Speed boost for an ability. Evolution at level 33 with ancient power. It is all so good. You can get bug buzz with a heart scale as soon as it evolves. It might be a little tough getting there, but if you can, this can sweep right through teams thanks to that ability and the fact that it has a good move so early on. I've used the Yanma family in Gen 4, and it's just downright fun if you teach it Protect through TM and get a free turn of speed boost. It is so awesome. Sadly, it's only found in the Great Marsh, but I feel like we can forgive it. It has plenty of redeeming qualities. Tropius. The walking palm tree is about as good as you would expect a walking palm tree to be, and I don't mean to rag on Executor when I say that. It wants to be bulky, but it comes off as just kind of average, and its weird type doesn't really do it many favors in the way of defense. However, that's not to say it's useless. Tropius learns five HM moves, and you can get all of the HM moves taught between it and Bee Barrel. Unfortunately, it's only catchable here. Rhyhorn, not what you would expect because it's not a rock ground type, it's a ground rock type. I don't know why it's backwards because that doesn't actually mean anything special, but the Rhyhorn family's always just been that one that had it backwards. <laughs> Thought I'd point it out. Okay, you might want to consider this if you're playing Platinum. You're able to obtain the protector it needs to fully evolve during the main story. And if it has the ability Rockhead as a Rhyhorn, it will ultimately get the ability Solid Rock. This reduces super effective hits on it by one quarter damage. It makes its type a lot more workable, and on top of its really good stats just all around, that can be really good. Downside is, it doesn't evolve into Rhydon until level 42, and we have a lot of water types coming up, so it might be a little difficult to raise it first, but it's still really good. The Rhydon, a heavy hitter with good defense. But due to the poor defensive type, low speed, and low special defense, it's a bit of a glass cannon compared to other Pokemon we'll be fighting here. It starts with Horn Drill, if that sounds like fun to you. It might. Horn Drill with X accuracy in single player can be very fun. It also gets some great moves leveling up like Stone Edge, uh, Earthquake, and even Mega Horn. We already have the Protector from Iron Island, so Rhydon can immediately evolve if traded. 
You want to do this. Make absolutely sure Rhydon has Rockhead for its ability. If it does not have Rockhead, it will have Lightning Rod and it will keep that when it evolves. You need to have Rockhead for its ability for it to turn into solid rock so that you can have that awesome defensive ability that mitigates its poor typing as a Rhyperior. It's very instrumental in covering weaknesses and it makes the Pokemon a lot more viable than it would be otherwise. The only real complaint I have is that the level requirements for its moves are really steep as a Rhyperior, so you might want to consider exactly when you want to evolve it by checking when it learns specific moves. Duskull! I feel awful. Okay, um, well, Duskull, let's, let's get the good out of the way first. It has a good type. It's immune to f fighting and normal. It's bulky. It's got some new toys like Shadow Sneak. That's a priority ghost type move that circumvents its poor speed. It got a new evolution in this game. One semi-bad thing about it is the fact that it does not keep its ability as Levitate forever. Once it evolves, it gets pressure, which just doubles your foe's PP usage when they attack you. I wish it stayed with Levitate, honestly, but that's not why I feel bad for it. I plan to use this Pokemon on my team in Emerald, and I dropped it for another Pokemon. I plan to use it on my team in XD, and I ended up dropping it for another Pokemon. I think you know why I feel bad for it again here. Yeah, why did I drop it? Well, I tried using it in another playthrough to see how viable it was, and because it's encountered at level 20 and evolves at level 37, it's just not very good as a Dust Skull. It really isn't. It was just so difficult to use, never came in handy for really any situation. It did laughably poor damage in its base form, and just with evolution being so far off, I just decided that I didn't want to do it, and I feel awful. If it were just higher leveled when caught, I probably would go for it, but sadly, it's not. I'm sorry, Duskull. I really do like you. Dusclops! In a lot of cases, I'm like, hey, remember that pre-evolution that we saw earlier in the adventure? Well, it's like that, only better. Not so with Dusclops. Has much higher stats, of course. It's at the point in its life where it actually gets helpful level up moves, which Duskull had trouble with being at such a low level. And it's just all around a really good tank. Only unfortunate thing is it lost its ability of levitate for pressure, and I don't know how to feel about that. I wish it kept levitate. It's such a good ability, and it's so tanky. Only other thing is we have the ability to make it evolve right away with the Reaper Cloth. Though, Dust Noir isn't the most necessary evolution in the way of tanking. It really only gains a sizable amount of attack. But that's not so bad, is it? Porygon is the only Pokemon capable of evolving through a trade twice. It's not really anything special on its own. Some lackluster stats. It's got that nice gimmick of being able to change its type mid-battle thanks to the conversion moves, which is nice, I guess. But the thing that we're really here to see is that you can evolve Porygon right away after catching it because we already have the upgrade from the Eterna Galactic building. Porygon 2 is a mixed wall. Stands up to pretty much any attack in the way of stats at least pretty well. You can view its pure normal type as a blessing or a curse in terms of how well it's going to wall stuff. It's kind of nice only having one weakness, but what does it resist? It's immune to ghost and whatever. You know how typing works, I'm just saying that it's both a good thing and a bad thing, up to you how you want to look at it. The downside about Porygon 2 in this game is that it became a lot more useful later on in the series thanks to the Eviolite. Didn't exist in 4th generation, so you can't do that yet, but it's a fairly good wall if you're looking for a more defensive Pokemon and you want one that can learn a lot of different moves, then this is definitely for you. What I've been really excited to talk about though is that if you trade it again after getting the dubious disc, which unfortunately we're still a ways off from getting, you can get the all new Porygon Z. Well, all new by 2007 standards, but who's counting? Um, Porygon Z gets rid of some of those defenses that Porygon 2 had in favor of special attack and speed. That's why I wanted to give Porygon 2 its own bio, is that as a tank, this is very much not. But that's not a bad thing. Porygon Z has a higher stat total than Porygon 2, and I gotta say, I think it works very well as a special sweeper. It really does. Both of its abilities are really nice for it, so it's really up to you what you want. I think adaptability is better for multiplayer, but I would not blame you at all for wanting download in single player, for instance. Um, there's the fact that it's another one of those Pokemon where there's legitimate advantages to not evolving it all the way. 
so it's really up to personal taste how you want to raise it. There's the fact that it learns all kinds of great TM moves for special attacking, and they knew what they were doing. They gave us Porygon in Veilstone City for free. Veilstone City, I cannot imagine a place in Sinnoh that has more wonderful special attacking TMs that you can get all in one place. It's amazing. Um, heck, I considered using this on my team for a little while before settling on using Clefairy for my normal type. The only reason I didn't is what I said before, that you don't get the dubious disc for a while, so it really wouldn't get much time to see use, but yeah. Maybe you could even have a tank on your team for a while, and then when you find a more defensive Pokemon, you could then just evolve up into Porygon Z. It's just really, really great. All in all, really good. I can recommend both of Porygon's evolutions for completely different reasons. Scyther is an excellent damage dealer and one of my favorite Pokemon in concept. Even if you can't trade to evolve it, I can still recommend Scyther because there are legitimate advantages to not evolving it. If it stays a Scyther, it'll be faster than its evolution and it'll be a bug flying type. If it evolves into Scizor, it will see a drop in speed in return for higher attack and higher defense, as well as the super defensive type of bug and steel. Technician is a super fun ability, and it actually starts with wing attack, allowing it to use that to its full extent. That's one reason you might want to keep it as a flying type, as it gets same type attack bonus. With legitimate advantages to not evolving Scyther, I really like this. I wish there were more Pokemon like it. In fact, if you don't believe me when I say that Scyther is viable, Scyther and Scizor have the exact same stat total, just distributed differently. Electabuzz! Definitely something worth considering if there's still room on your team for it. It's far more common than Magneton, and it also starts with Discharge at the levels encountered, but unlike Magneton, it does get Thunderbolt in a few more levels. We already have the Electrizer, meaning that we can immediately evolve it, and if you're willing to use TMs, Electabuzz and Electivire are well known for having many different types of moves, making up for the fact that electric type moves aren't going to be the most useful from here on out in our main journey. Plus, Electivire's immunity to electric type moves with its awesome ability of motor drive is something to behold. The only real downside is that Electivire's biggest claim to fame of incredible type coverage, the moves that made it famous like Ice Punch aren't available without breeding, but other than that, it should perform well on any team for single player. Magmar! The Magmar family are mixed attackers, and this is helped by the physical special split, of course. We've had the Magmarizer, the item necessary for Magmar to evolve for some time now, so like I said, you can evolve it right away. Magmortar is one of the more bizarre new evolutions to come around in Diamond Pearl Platinum, at least in my opinion. It does gain a respectable 25 special attack over what Magmar had, so I think it is worth it for that alone. But its other stats only go up by 10 points each, with the exception of speed, which actually drops by 10 points when it evolves from Magmar. It's nothing unusual for Pokemon to focus on different stats after they evolve, but it is worth at least noting. With a heart scale, Magmortar can be taught Thunder Punch, which might be nice in the way of type coverage, give you a way of dealing with water types. I also suppose you could see it as a jack of all trades, considering it's only really bad stat is defense, but hey, up to you what you want to use it for. I don't think it's a bad Pokemon, just a very bizarre one, but hey, if I had a butt on my head, I think I'd be pretty relieved to see that when I grow up, I would instead have an arm cannon. I'd say that's a pretty good trade-off, because it evolves through trading. I, I shouldn't explain things. A swine up. After being mediocre for so long, it's got a new evolution! I always love saying that, it happens so often in Gen 4. It isn't hard to get either. You'll get Piloswine rather fast after catching it, but you will need a heart scale to teach Piloswine ancient power before it will evolve. You should have plenty of those, and if you don't, there's plenty of daily things, as well as the underground you can use to get them. Not difficult. As a Mamoswine, it's bulky, powerful, and got surprisingly decent speed. It gets Earthquake leveling up, it's all around a really good Pokemon. I guess the only downside I could really say is that it can't access all of its really good moves by leveling up and doesn't really learn much in the way of special attacks leveling up, but it's not bad. Really, it's not. Snow Runt, and when I say strange, I don't necessarily mean in the good way. It's the counterpart to Ralts in being an alternate use for the Dawnstone and a new split evolution based on gender. Honestly, I'm pretty happy I used my Dawnstone on my Curly instead. You are given two options with this Pokemon, and the first of them is 100% awful. It's wait until level 42 so you can get Glalie, a P 
pure ice type Pokemon with 80 in every stat. Pretty much any ice type Pokemon out there will do its job better than it can because those stats are awful and it's such a horrible reward for hard work too with how long it takes to get it. The second option is Frostlass, which only female Snowruns can become if you use the Dawnstone. It has the unique type of Ice Ghost, and moves of those types give it some good type coverage. One fun option is that it learns Destiny Bond, has low defenses, and a lot of weaknesses. You can use this to your advantage, and I've personally done so before. It served me pretty well. I'd suggest Frostlass over Glalie, but you are going to have to treat Frostlass well like glass. It's very delicate, and it's not going to be exactly like Gengar by any means, so treat it like its own thing. Absol, your attack stat is amazing, and I love you so, so much. The physical special split has been incredibly kind to Absol. It'll be level 38 to 40 when caught. You'll get Sucker Punch at 44, Night Slash at 52, meaning that it finally gets what it so desperately needed in Gen 3, dark type moves that use that high attack stat. If you've never used an Absol before, now might be the time. Not just a wild Giratina appeared, the Distortion World's Giratina appeared. Even the text is inconsistent in this alternate dimension. Like with any battle against a legendary Pokemon, I highly recommend that you save before taking this on. Also, it is always worth your time to throw a quick ball at the beginning of any encounter just in the off chance that it somehow works. Giratina, with its amazingly cool type of Ghost and Dragon. Oh man, I thought I actually did it! <laughs> Sorry. Giratina, with its unique ghost dragon type that is cool to even say, is a downright aggressive Pokemon. Its origin form, what it is currently before us in, has 120 in both attacking stats, plus gets a 10% boost to ghost and dragon type damage. The ability to levitate and the natural immunities to fighting and normal also make it viable as a switch in in many situations. All around, it's just cool, cool, cool. And I'm trying to make it even cooler by freezing up my ice beam because that'd make it a lot easier to catch. As for moves, I hate to say it, but after the streak of compliments that I've just given it, it only learns one new move every 10 levels, and most of them are nothing to write home about. The moves it already has are what you're going to be sticking with for a long time unless you have TMs that you want to use on it. You also do not have access to this form right away if you are to catch it. If you capture Giratina, it will instead be in its altered form. This is the more defensive counterpart of the two. There's not much reason to use it now that the origin form exists once you get access to that form, of course. But yeah, there's not really much else to say that hasn't already been said about Giratina's um, origin form. It just swaps its offensive and defensive stats. Pidgey. Why? <laughs> if you're gonna give me a level 50 wild Pidgey in the after game, just save me the extra little inconvenience and give me a wild Pidgeot. Seriously, why not? Okay, in all seriousness, it's pretty average. This is the case with most Pokemon lately, but Pidgey is outclassed by quite a few other flying types we've had access to for ages now. It really is encountered around level 50, so it can immediately get any heart scale move its heart desires. See what I did there? Ratata up here, and Raticate too. As per usual, it's too a little too late. It does get some all right moves, such as Endeavor, Super Fang, and Double Edge. Plus, all of its level up moves are available from the start, regardless of which form it's caught in and which level it's caught at here, as long as you're playing Platinum. They're faster than normal utility Pokemon, which are all right. Spearow and Fero are next. Spearow is only in Diamond and Pearl, while Fero is the only one that you'll find in Platinum. While a little generic, Fero is basically a faster, lighter, more aggressive Pidgeot. Again, all moves available from the time that it is encountered. Sand Slash. I always dread talking about this guy. I want him to be good, but it's just so outclassed, doesn't work all that well. You might look at it and think, he can't be that bad. His Earthquake probably hits harder than Doug Trio's, right? Yeah, it does. Once you use a TM on it, why does it have to be that way? It's slow, it's super fragile against pretty much any respectable special move. I don't get it, it wouldn't be overpowered if it learned it by level up. Its level up moves are trash, or rather, slash. 
Yeah, that is the strongest move it gets by leveling up. In fact, the only damaging ground type move it gets through level up is Sand Tomb. The only possible explanation for it being this terrible in the fourth region is that somebody at Game Freak just hates it. That has to be it. And I bet they sit between the guy who hates Farfetch'd and the desk of the guy who used to hate Flareon, because I guess it's not really as bad now. But still, Sandshrew is so cute. Sandslash is cool looking. Let it be good. And with Oddish and Gloom, both can be encountered on this route, and both are high enough level to come with Petal Dance and Giga Drain. Gloom is the higher level of the two, does not matter which one you catch, they will both have the same moves. On to the future that you may have with one of these radish things. It's the first split evolution we've seen in a very long time. Vile Plume is an incredibly standard grass poison type. Pretty much all the moves that you would expect with nothing unusual. It does good special damage and it's a little bulky, though in the vein of being a generic grass poison type, it's pretty slow for this point in the adventure. It will learn Solar Beam at level 63, and that's it. Will Diglett and Doug Trio be able to break that streak and keep it from becoming a six in the middle of all this positivity? Yes. Yes, they will. This is what I've been waiting for. Doug Trio is known as the revenge killer for a reason. That blistering speed is enough reason to want it, but man, Earthquake as soon as it's caught, access to Slash, Night Slash, Sucker Punch, and Fissure, it's so good as a switch-in, and that ability is downright crippling on electric types in multiplayer if it is switched in successfully. It's not just good, it's great. Poliwag and Poliwhirl, another split evolution. This family all have the ability to use Hypnosis, somewhat of a rarity among their kin of water types, Unfortunately, Hypnosis is only 60% accurate in Platinum, so it's nowhere near the zaniness of 70% accurate that it was in Diamond and Pearl. Oh, yeah, and options. Split Evolution, right. They are Polyrath, a water fighting type, something you don't see every day. It's a jack of all trades, both in stats and in being a mixed attacker. And it learns what you'd expect. Bell Sprout and Weepin' Bell. This is a grass poison family with decent speed and is meant to do mixed attacking. There are multiple possibilities here for movesets if you want to use TMs, and maybe drop a few heart scales as well. Both are high enough level that they will have Ring Out Slam and Razor Leave upon being caught, and probably the most negative thing I can say here is that the levels they're caught at force you to use heart scales for Victory Bell to get Leaf Storm and Leaf Blade, but just from the moves I've mentioned from level up and heart scale alone, it already sounds fun! That's not a bad thing! Seal. What is so dumb about Seal, and why am I freaking out so much over it? Yeah, not only did we already talk about Dugong, but Seal is only found in Diamond version, even though Dugong is in all other versions of the game just fine. I kind of wonder if this was just a leftover, where they originally intended for this family to be exclusive to Diamond and then forgot to change it on this route. I don't know, but I'm not giving it a real bio. Besides, it's his own fault for being so obscure, and for sticking his tongue out at me too. Dugong! I can't imagine this habitat works out very well for it, but... There's no but, actually. I, I really legitimately can't think of any reason why you'd find this on the ground and not in the water. Dugong, though, when it is encountered, it will instantly know Ice Beam, making it really useful, and you also have that Surf HM, giving it good offensive options. In terms of stats, it seems to be like it's trying to be a tank, but comes off more like a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. It's alright. I'm not really sure if you would be lacking a water type this late in the game, but if you still need to add one to your team, having those two moves the same type attack bonus right from the get-go can be an attractive feature. Or features. Shelter! I think this one's more of a clam, but its evolution is nonetheless. What was once known as an incredible physical wall has not aged. Despite solid speed and offense for how high its defense is, its water ice type when fully evolved and the advent of better rock type moves including stealth rock have hurt it to say the least. Both of its abilities can be fun and it's not horrible, it's just not as viable as it once was. Weezing! I love this guy more than anyone should. It's a physical wall and a darn good one. Levitate complements its type so well giving it only a psychic weakness. It knows Sludge Bomb and Explosion no matter what when it's caught here. The worst things I can say about it are that it needs TMs to round out its type coverage, and that Will-O-Wisp is an egg move. A 
Of course, I knock a lot of other Pokemon points for the same reasons. I'm biased, okay? Horsey and Seedra. The good rod nets a horsey. But okay, seriously. The super rod hooks a Seedra. I'm so stupid. Okay, seriously this time. Just go for the Seedra. It can be encountered as high as level 55 compared to Horsey's measly 25. It evolves into Kingdra, one of my personal favorites. Its stats are balanced and it's only weak to dragon with helpful quad resistances to fire and water. It's just so annoying to fight against and it feels so good when the enemy has just nothing they can do against it. Kingdra learns all the same moves at all the same levels as Seedra. The only thing I don't like about it is that it doesn't benefit from Dragon Dance all that much due to Waterfall and Return being the only good physical moves that it learns. That being said, it's hard to recommend. Why? I was just praising it a second ago. It evolves with the dragon scale. So where do you get that? It's held by wild Horsey, Seedra, Dratini, and Dragonair 5% of the time. That's the only way to get it in Platinum. Have fun! <laughs> Star you. Tried and true, it's one of the best special attacking families of all time, and it's never been bad. A lot of the good TMs it learns can be bought in one way or another, but keep in mind that its level up moves become severely limited after it evolves. It's also a good user of Rapid Spin, which nullifies moves like Stealth Rock and Toxic Spikes, so it even has multiple uses on top of being a good special sweeper. So the Ice Psychic type isn't as crazy overpowered as it was in days of old. It's been knocked down a few pegs, but Jinx is still a respectable special attacker. Lapras. This is a slightly tankier, slightly slower, slightly higher special attack Dugong. It sounds convoluted when I say it like that, but that's the best comparison that I can draw between the two because they have the same type and they fulfill very similar purposes. Lapras can be found at a much wider level range than Dugong, anywhere from 35 to 55. So it might take a while to find a Lapras that you might want to actually add to your team if it's that low of level. The reason why I'm telling you this is because it has good moves that fall all within this level range. It gets Ice Beam at 32, so it might very well have that when you catch it, but it also gets Hydro Pump at 49, Brine at 37, and Sheer Cold at 55. It's strange, but I do like it. It's tanky, has some decent type coverage of those two moves that it gets same type attack bonus from, though its type might not be the best at tanking overall. In which we're fighting one right now, is this gonna be Zapdos again? No, Articuno! Time has not been kind to Articuno. In days of old, when Blizzard was 90% accurate, the special stat was one, and rock type moves weren't all that common, Articuno was a very feared beast. Now, strangely, it's a special tank with an unfortunate quad weakness to rock in an age where rock type moves are very commonly seen and stealth rock reigns supreme. Things aren't all bad though, because it starts with Ice Beam, which is the, about the best thing you'd ever want from an Ice type. And while it doesn't do nearly as much damage as it once did, it's not horrible. Dramatic tension, which is our first encounter, Zapdos. This is one Pokemon I think is good in every single Pokemon game to ever come out. I have never met a person who didn't have good things to say about Zapdos. Electric Flying is a great type that's hard to deal with. Both halves complement the other remarkably well. It's lightning fast, tee -hee, and it's good at both types of damage. The only really bad thing is that most Zapdos are the same and there isn't a lot of room for experimentation if you wanted to do something unique. All Zapdos are gonna have Thunderbolt and Drill Peck, but really, is that such a bad thing? Okay, maybe a little, because it starts with neither in this game and Thunderbolt is locked behind using a TM on it, but even then, it's still worth your time and has remained one of the best Pokemon out there for two decades. There's a reason why it still pops up in tournaments. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go teach Mean Look. Wow, found Moltres is my very next encounter after fighting that Articuno. Guess there's no better time than to go over the final one. Moltres is a surprisingly solid special attacker, and it can be a nice late addition to a team in need of a fire type. Especially since, even with the better Platinum Sinnoh decks, fire type options have still been pretty limited. It can get Flamethrower right away through a Heart Scale, and it starts with Air Slash. The most negative thing that I can point out is its quad weakness to Rock, just like Articuno. But even then, it comes with some helpful resistances, and the flying complements fire decently well. You're pretty likely to not have a fire type on your team, and if you've been really hurting for one, you could do worse than Moltres. 
Though it's not in the same league as Zapdos, not even close. I still stand by Zapdos being easily the best of the three, but Moltres in this particular game, it's not bad either. Dratini and Dragonair. This family of Pokemon have very steep evolution requirements, but thankfully, because they're caught with the Super Rod, that's not such a big deal now, is it? Their final form, yes, Dragonair is not even his final form, had to be said, is a pretty good all-around Pokemon. Dragonite learns all kinds of different moves, physical and special, and has no terrible stats. Not much else to say, he's always been good. Bledian. You can't give me a wild, fully evolved Pidgeot, but you give me this. Sure. It's an inexplicable combination of speed and special defense. Personally, I think it was a generation too late when it was made. If it existed back in red and blue when special was one stat, it might have actually been good at the time of its debut. It, but instead, it's another terrible bug flying type that there's virtually no reason to use. For positives, Mach Punch and Silver One with heart scales, and learning Bug Buzz soon after it's caught is all I've got. Next is Ariados. Yeah, low stats, out of place. It was meant to be an early game way of dealing with grass types. You know the drill. The most interesting thing here is that it will know Psychic when caught, but enjoy using it with 60 special attack and no same type attack bonus. Yay! Chinchou and Lantern. For the love of our Canine, yeah, Arcanine. Make sure that this has Volt Absorb, because wow, if there was ever a terrible ability to get stuck with, ugh. Anyway, it's encountered in a very wide level range, so just know that it learns Signal Beam and Discharge as moves of interest while leveling up. Like so many others, Thunderbolt is only available through TM. It's a kind of a cool Pokemon, if only for its type, so again, it might be fun for experienced players who want something different. I certainly don't totally dislike it, and it's far from the worst thing that we have seen in recent routes. Blossom, on the other hand, is a pure grass type. If evolved immediately from a Gloom when caught in the wild here, it will learn Leaf Storm. While pure grass is by no means the easiest type to slot in as the sixth member of a team, that's pretty darn cool. Other than that, it's also very standard for what it is. Its stats are even identical to Vile Plumes, aside from the special attack and special defense being swapped. Neither of them are awful, but kinda boring. In fact, they're so similar that their TM and HM learn sets are identical. Politoed, less of a jack of all trades and more of a special focus Pokemon. Again, it's pretty much what you'd expect other than the hypnosis thing. Remember that Politoed, though, cannot get Drizzle for its ability in Sinnoh, so don't use it for that reason. Otherwise, you'll be very disappointed, and it would also come with a high recommendation from me, rather than just an okay. Slugma and Macargo. The only time I ever recall recommending Macargo was in a game that had 40 obtainable Pokemon before its final area. Not a good sign. Okay, defense stat jumps out as something that would be pretty good. If only its type weren't garbage. It wants to be a tank, but it would have a hard time tanking against anything that has halfway decent type coverage because its weaknesses are so common, and its pitiful speed means that it will so rarely get to even move. How fitting for a snail! The best thing about it is that it actually doesn't need a TM to use Flamethrower. What makes you so special? Quillfish, which is a weird Pokemon. It clearly wants to be a Swift Swim Sweeper, and it does that pretty well, I guess. It gets Poison Jab leveling up, and Waterfall is an easy option to teach it, plus it has the ability to learn the elusive Explosion TM. Its type is pretty good on the defense, but it lacks power for being a Swift Swim Sweeper. As expected, you would want to use this in the rain, but there's better options out there. Corsola is why. Let's get this over with. No stat over 85, both of which are defensive when its type is not exactly tanky, one of the slowest Pokemon in the entire game because, you know, those stats and types so make up for it. Incredibly weak attack stats, low power moves all over its move pool, and it never evolves into anything better. If this were early in the adventure, I might recommend it as a temporary team member, but what is it doing all the way out here? I guess on the positive side with its type and bad stats, it's good at using Mirror Coat, Skarmory, is probably the more usable wall. Great defense, even greater defensive type, can safely switch in on so much, has all level up moves open to it here. What more do you want? Well, for one, Drill Peck is an egg move in Platinum, and that is sorely missed if you don't want to fuss around with raising a Skarmory from level one. 
I've just come to realize how adorable a Skarmory chick would be. That must happen! Even if they're more or less done with creating new baby Pokemon, I need to see a Skarmory chick. That would be so cute. <laughs> Smoochum evolves into Jinx at a fixed level of 30. For this reason, I would actually suggest catching it as a Smoochum, as it will already have access to both Blizzard and Psychic if done this way. As per usual though, Ice Beam is locked behind a TM. Seems like that's just the thing of everything in this region. Um, but speaking of TMs, it is seriously a good user of Calm Mind if you want to teach it that as well. Basically, it's good at doing damage, but its type prevents it from being much else. Surskit and Masquerade. Seriously, you're gonna give me five out of place early game bug type families in a row? <laughs> Uh, the Sin of Naysayers might have their day yet in this adventure. I'll admit though, the ability of Intimidate is great, and it certainly does do at least something to separate it from the enormous pack of terrible bug flying types. Air Slash and Silverwind from the get-go are good too, but man, why does it take it until level 61 to learn Bug Buzz? It's worth mentioning that Surskit and Masquerade have drastically different move pools, so at least see what Surskit can learn before choosing to just go catch a Masquerade or choosing to just let Surskit evolve. Man though, all these terrible bug types can go BUZZ OFF! I have earned that, we are done! Volbeat! I don't want to keep saying the same things this whole time, so I'll just skip to what makes it unique and positive. Bug Buzz and Zen Headbutt from the start are neat. Plus, it can learn Roost through TM despite what you would expect from its type. That's kind of cool. It also is one of only two Pokemon, the other being Manaphy, that can naturally learn Tail Glow, which will sharply raise your own special attack stat. That's a pretty neat move. It also is the only Pokemon that naturally learns Flash without the need for the TM70. So if you don't want to go and get another TM70 and you can catch a Volbeat here, get a Heart Scale, you can always reteach it. That can be helpful if you have not yet explored those areas with Flash and you don't have a Pokemon that can help you in that and you can't remember what you used your TM on. Illumise is the same Pokemon, only with its attacking stats flipped and with no ability to learn Tail Glow. Yeah, that's seriously it. And before we go onward, yes, the pronunciation is what I am going with. The anime and Pokedex 3D Pro will back me up on this. I just personally felt the need to emphasize it because not only on the internet do I get criticized for my pronunciation of Illumise, even though multiple sources say that I am correct, it's probably the thing I get corrected on the most in real life. Whenever I mention Illumise, there's always some person I know that has not been there when I've mentioned it before saying, don't you mean Illumise? Though I can't blame you for thinking it would be pronounced that way, because they should have used the accented E to get that across, and other Pokemon have that accented E, like Flip A Bay. They could have at least retconned it in later games when lowercase letters were part of Pokemon names. But I digress. Sharpedo! Only found in Diamond and Pearl, this was a Pokemon that begged for the physical special split. It's a physical sweeper consisting entirely of types that were special before it. It gets Ice Fang, Slash, and Aqua Jet through level up, but unlike the present day, it needs to reach the high level of 56 for Night Slash. It can work, but it certainly isn't an orthodox water type by any means at all. Whalmer and Whale Lord, these gargantuan behemoth giants. Yeah, overstating things when Whale Lord is actually on the smaller side of real world whales. It specializes in offense and HP, a unique combination that allows it to take full advantage of both water spout and brine, moves that it naturally gets. Much like Sharpedo, well, actually it's not at all like Sharpedo, but I'm kind of drawing the parallel of it's not your typical water type, but it's usable. Nummel and Camerupt. The only Pokemon other than Rhyperior to have solid rock for its ability. Though I'd argue the ability is less useful here than in Rhyperior due to Camerupt only having two weaknesses, it's still a pretty cool feather in its cap. Funny, as I remember back in Emerald, I misspoke and said Camerupt had a lot of weaknesses instead of saying that its water weakness was common, which... For some reason, that was one of those little mistakes that got burned into my memory for years to come and bothered me way more than it should have. Anyway, enough about me and my explanations of camera up that aren't this one. Earthquake from the start, Rock Slide from the start, Lava Plume through Heart Scale. It's pretty darn good at what it does and if there's room for it to come with you. Cacnea and Cacturn. They may seem awkward at first glance and, well, they kind of are. 
They're glass cannons with respectable strength on both attacking fronts. In the way of good moves, there's Sucker Punch, Needle Arm, Destiny Bond, and Revenge in there. I kinda like these guys. I know they're not the greatest, most stellar Pokemon out there, but there's just something cool about a Pokemon that benefits from Sandstorms without being the right type. It's right at home on a team that takes advantage of that, and it gives it variety. Corefish's encounter levels are much higher than Crawdon, even though they are both caught using the Super Rod. I would suggest catching it as a Corefish, since that can be up to level 55, as opposed to Crawdon only being as high as level 40. It also has the draw of having access to all of its level up moves right away if it's caught at at least level 53, which Crawdon will not have. So definitely, catch it as a Corefish, teach it the moves that you want, level it up one time, there you go, new team member. Crawdont is a physical attacking water dark type Pokemon, a horrible combination at the time of its debut. Thankfully, Crunch, Crab Hammer, and probably most thankfully Waterfall are now physical attacks, so it can actually do something. Bayonet is a little weird. It tries to be a mixed attacker, but it's slow and pretty frail. It has good moves, among them are Sucker Punch, Shadow Ball, Will-O-Wisp, and Shadow Sneak. <laughs> it's all right, but like so many others, there's been better options out there for a while now. Sfeel and Celio, or just Celio in Platinum, or nothing at all in Diamond. Water and Ice is kind of a neat type in terms of offense, and it's pretty bulky, but I can't say I think too highly of it for when it comes available. No Ice Beam through level up is disappointing, especially when it has Aurora Beam just fine. It also will only resist its own types, so it manages to keep the dubious honor it would have if it were just a pure Ice type of only resisting itself. Trying to speak positively about at least some things, it has you do have your Surf HM, and it will almost certainly evolve in one level of being caught. It's just unlikely that it will do a better job than something that's already on a team at this point in the adventure. Clampearl! Well, the Clampearl family, actually, it's a split evolution. In its base form, Clampearl is admittedly not as rock solid as it looks, but it's still defensive nonetheless. Should you want Clamp, Iron Defense, or Water Gun for some reason to stay with it later in life, it needs to keep them from this stage as it cannot learn them after they evolve. Both sides of the split evolution are slow mixed attackers. If traded with the Deep Sea Tooth, it becomes Huntail, the more physical of the two. Despite this distinction, a lot of the good moves it learns through any source are special, and I consider it the weaker of the two for this reason. The Deep Sea Scale will instead yield Gorbis, the special version, and what I consider to be superior personally. It's by no means amazing, and that speed hurts outside of rain. Heck, it's not even that good in rain. But it's unique if nothing else. It actually does have Psychic as a level up move. I'd suggest this family only for experienced players wanting something different out of a water type, cause I'm pretty sure most players out there have never tried using these guys. I certainly can't say I know many people that have. Relicant. Yet another strange Pokemon. I guess to be fair, Staryu was at least strange in its concept and appearance, so I won't be too hard on it. It's yet another rock type with high defense. But it's not quite as molasses as other rock types can be. And it can be a good counter to other rock types, due to them being slightly slower than it, combined with Relicanth getting same type attack bonus from water moves. Relicanth also has an attractive feature, and I'm clearly not talking about its face. <laughs> okay, no, it actually is its face. Relicanth can learn Head Smash, get same type attack bonus from it, and have Rock Head for its ability. Unfortunately, it learns it at level 78, so it's gonna take some serious training to see this thing's true potential. There is a single new Pokemon that we are able to find at the Pokemon League if we fish using the Super Rod. And this is seriously the note that we are ending things on? Love Disc! <laughs> uh, <laughs> this did not deserve this spot. Coming in after Arceus, Dialga, Palkia, all those dramatic encounters, all those powerful Pokemon, everything that I've been able to gush over that I have loved, we are ending on Love Disc. When talking about Love Disc, I have a bit of a tradition, or at least it's becoming one here today because it's the second time that I am doing this. Regardless of what your opinion is on the website, Smoggin has an article about Love Disc that I think describes it better than I ever could do. So giving full credit to them, 
Here's what I would like to say about Love Disc. We'll take a generic water type, give it crummy stats everywhere except for speed, give him a trait that doubles the speed in rain, and the option to use agility, and call it a day. Love Disc is great if you're playing with Battle Timeout because its mere presence should cause your opponent to laugh at it for so long that you win the match. I said all this before, so to make things a little bit more unique and special, we'll tack on the clause where they mention that Charm turns Love Disc into a very sturdy physical wall that can survive two Caterpie tackles and force it to switch out. <laughs> yeah, it's not exactly the best Pokemon. It doesn't exist for battling. What it does exist for, however, is to be your easy source of heart scales. It has a high chance of holding them in the wild, and if you were to use Thief on it or just catch it, it is able to serve that purpose for you. We got a cave entrance that was not present in Diamond and Pearl, and it's a perfect square, and it's got an elemental item in the middle of it. This is what is known as the Rock Peak Chamber. If you have access to a certain event and yada yada yada, I think you know where I'm going with this. If you have access to that long dead event that you can no longer get, in this cave, you can battle the legendary Pokemon, Regirock. Incredibly strong and resilient when it comes to physical attacks. This dishes out damage and it takes it like a champ. In fact, Regirock's defense is tied for being the highest stat held by any legendary Pokemon, tied only with Regiice's special defense. Its attack is not all that bad either if you take the defense aside from that. You can only obtain it with that event, of course, and it's also level 30 instead of the usual 40. Rock isn't the greatest defensive type, but it's the stats that you would get this for. It starts with Stomp, Rock Throw, Curse, and Superpower in its moveset, which are certainly not bad. It's Ancient Power at 33 and, oh boy, Iron Defense at 41. It has awesome capabilities to tank, and it'll do decent damage as well. I feel like I'm just repeating myself here, but that is what Regirock stands for and not much else. And in this area, there is a cave that is only in Platinum version. Get the Never Melt Ice, in all of its awkwardly named glory, raises the power of ice type moves. This room is only in Platinum, and in it, if you have access to a certain event Pokemon from many, many years ago, you are able to find the legendary Pokemon, Regiice, also a nugget. Regiice is a fantastic special wall. It might have reigned supreme back in Generation 3 and been knocked down a few pegs, but it's definitely still viable. Though I will say the physical special split was not kind to pure ice types and only further pronounced their many weaknesses. While Regiice is still good as a special wall, remember that ice only resists itself. Plus, all types now have physical moves to play around with. As such, you might have a hard time switching into it, but it can still function as a wall if used at the right times. This here, cave entrance, is only in platinum version. This is still Iron Island, but more importantly, it's got a metal coat in it. You could trade in Onyx holding that to evolve. Why would you when you have Steelix? Use it to evolve a Scyther into Scizor. It's the smart thing to do. This room immediately has no purpose. There was a DLC event that ran a long, long time ago for Pokemon Platinum. If you had access to that Wi-Fi event, which I do not, unfortunately, you would have been able to battle the legendary Pokemon, Registeel. With some strong defenses on both fronts and a pure Steel type, Registeel can definitely serve as a tank. It starts with Stomp, Metal Claw, Curse, and Superpower. Plus, it gets Explosion with Heart Scales. It also learned some nice moves later on, including the nice new Gen 4 moves like Charge Beam and Flash Cannon. The biggest real problem that Registeel runs into is just that it does more tanking than attacking, and that might not be for everyone. I highly suggest that you save before moving forward. For after doing all this, atop the Spear Pillar is this portal. On the other side of the rift, in a fantastically bizarre place. It's Dialga. Will you challenge Dialga? <laughs> With the unique Dragon Steel type making it an even better tank than its already bulky stats would have you believe. Dialga is a tank that can switch in easily, take hits well, and do huge damage after the fact. Dialga's signature move is Roar of Time, a Dragon-type variant of Hyper Beam. 
Not exactly helpful in multiplayer battles, but I'm sure Supernova will vouch for it being fun in single player. As if 150 special attack weren't enough, if given the Adamant Orb, Dialga will see a 20% boost to both Dragon type and Steel type moves. It's exceptionally fast for tank standards, allowing it to outright avoid damage where other walls would not be able to. The only big negative I can say about it is that Dragon and Steel aren't exactly the best types for offense, but it already has access to Power Gem and Earth Power to make up for this. It's a darn good Pokemon! And probably strangest of all, Dialga's catch rate is 30. Yeah, the creator of time has the same catch rate as a Chadot, go figure. <laughs> After you leave the Spear Pillar and return, you now have this portal in the other one's place. On the other side of the rift, in a fantastically bizarre place. It's Palkia! Will you challenge Palkia? <laughs>is a force to be reckoned with. It is one of the greatest mixed attackers of all time and its stats beautifully back up its more offensively viable type that also manages to only be weak to Dragon here. Palkia's signature move is Spatial Rend, a 100 power special Dragon type move with a high critical hit ratio. When it's equipped with a move that powerful and has 100 speed with Dragon as its only weakness, it's hard to say that oh, I thought I got it in only the quick fall. It's hard to say that Palkia even has a weakness at all in this situation. The only dragon types with higher speed than Palkia are Salamence, Latios, Latios, and Garchomp. Palkia is able to one or two hit dang near anything that exists if it's given the Lustrous Orb. It sees a 20% boost to water and dragon type moves, making it the counterpart to Dialga's Adamant Orb. Quite honestly, this is the first Pokemon we're fighting that I don't think has a single flaw to point out. It is probably the single most powerful Pokemon you will fight in all of Sinnoh. It's that good. Since I'm pretty sure you know something important is coming up, I suggest you save. A lot of data. And that is all. In we go. If you have said goodbye to Looker, returned to the survival area, entered the battleground, and talked to Buck inside the battleground, to cause him to leave for Battle Frontier. Only then will you be greeted with this. Heatran is one of the kings. With its Fire Steel type making it resist many helpful types, an ability that not only gives it full immunity to all Fire type moves, but also makes it a great switch in if you can predict that sort of thing. Seriously, it's even triggered by things like Will-O-Wisp. Tanky stats and downright brutal damaging potential. Heatran still sees play to this day for a reason. Or six. Its move pool isn't bad either. It has Lava Plume from the start, gets Iron Head at 65, Earth Power at 73, and Stone Edge at 88. It even has a signature move, Magma Storm, that is learned at level 96. It's 120 power, 70% accurate, and it will continue to do trap damage for two to five turns. All in all, a fantastic Pokemon. Here we are. This is the lowermost floor of Snowpoint Temple. And look at that thing standing in the middle. I don't know why, but it just creeps me out. The fact that its face is just a bunch of holes and the pixel alias thing that's going on as we move around it makes it look even creepier. I don't know what it is, but I've always just felt really uneasy looking at that thing's face. So the sooner I figure out the simple puzzle intended for 10 year olds, the better. Ah, uh, I think I got it. I go down here, I go onto this, to the right, that makes me hit into that rock. Should I say slam into that rock with how I'm just liking my extreme wording today? I run into a wild Pokemon on the only tile! Are you. Here I'm like, I don't need to use repels because there's no encounters on the ass! And then I forget that this is a DS Pokemon game. I seem to also really like that accent lately, almost like as much as I like the word slam. Hit that rock, go that way, and we are in the center. Before going any further, I highly recommend that you save. 
Because once you step forward and you check this, it's a statue of a Pokemon. It seems to exude power. A body of rock, a body of ice, a body of steel. When gathers the three Pokemon, the king shall appear. Reggie Gigas is only level one. <laughs> oh, poor Reggie Gigas. <laughs> It was lowered from level 70 in Diamond and Pearl, and I don't know why. Ah, uh, poor, poor Reggie Gigas. On to the Pokemon itself. It's clear that they were trying to make another slacking, but they failed miserably. Reggie Gigas' stats are a thing of beauty, but its ability just downright cripples it. That's five consecutive turns of being out on the field without retreating at all to unshackle it from that ability. It does not learn Protect, it does not learn Detect, does not learn Rest, or any recovery moves at all in order to stall this out. The only moves that it can learn that remotely stall anything are Substitute and, I guess, Thunder Wave and Swagger. It doesn't get Skill Swap either, but that's fair. That would be pretty darn overpowered if it did somehow manage to learn that on its own. I would never suggest using Regigigas for anything but double battle. In which case, it is pretty darn powerful if you can use Skill Swap on it and unshackle it from its ability on just the first turn. It's ruthlessly powerful if you can do that. But for anything else, definitely pass on it. Up into one region. Now, this gives me a chance to talk about what I usually do when handling roaming Pokemon. I wouldn't quite recommend handling them the way I've been doing in these videos. It's just that... For wanting to show the information in a video and go over a topic without it being interrupted, it just kind of made sense to fight Mesprit as soon as we could because we had to go and see it for our Pokedex and all that stuff. Same thing with Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres. And that was three legendary Pokemon being fought in one video. It was already very long as it was. What I like to do is go and set off Mesprit, having it roam around the region, but don't go and try to catch it right away. Do the same for Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, and then do the same for this. With five roamers all running around the region, you are going to run into them all the time, and you're going to be very efficient in locating them all and weakening them. And since you're trying to catch five of them at once, you're able to just get it done a lot quicker, not have to go out into the field several times. It's just, in general, a lot more efficient of a process. And whenever I run into this dang thing, there is more to this tactic that I can tell you about. Finally, it's on the same route as me. What I was saying earlier, yeah, it really stands. Anytime you want to pop out at me, come on. Anytime. Anytime. Uh, if I take too long, it will transition to another route on its own. I can't afford for it to be taking this long. My rappel wore off before I saw it even one time. Are you for real right now? Also, yeah, after beating the champion, you get another starter trainer card. But we went over that in an earlier video when we had Sephon, so come on. Yep. Where? Wait. It's level 50, isn't it? Shoot. Crud, I assumed it was level 60 because of Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, but no, now that I'm thinking about it, it is level 50. I can't use repels to force it to appear. Come on. Please have a regular battle theme? <laughs> okay. Okay. Again, B Doof just popping up at the most unexpected times and being funny at it. It does have a regular battle theme. I was remembering it correctly. Cresselia. Light shines brightest in the dark. It is one of the best special tanks out there, and you need look no further than its stats and ability to see that. It gets Moonlight at level 57, so it can even heal itself without the need for items. It has the signature move Lunar Dance, enabling it to sacrifice itself to fully heal HP, status, and PP of the next Pokemon that is sent out. This isn't really anything special in single player, because you can just use items, but in multiplayer, it can turn the tides! 
Because it's the moon! Yeah! <laughs> okay. If Cresselia is at the end of its rope, you can sack it and bring back a crippled sweeper that got paralyzed earlier in the match. You can heal a nearly depleted tank to get even more tankiness out of your team. Or just something else on that level. The only negative aspects of Cresselia are that its level up moves kind of suck until it gets high up there in the levels in the fourth generation. The greatest example of this is that unless you use a TM, it doesn't learn Psychic until level 93. What? I don't get it either. Among all the Pokemon that appear in the newly upgraded Trophy Garden, one of them stands out as being useful for something other than battling. And that Pokemon is Ditto. Ditto is capable of breeding with any Pokemon at all that can produce eggs. It is a godsend when filling in your Pokedex, especially if you're transferring in Pokemon from your Game Boy Advance games. It's great for that purpose. However, it might be useful to you in obtaining a certain Pokemon that cannot be obtained by any way other than breeding. There is a lone legendary Pokemon that is capable of producing eggs in the daycare. This is the only time anything like this has ever happened. So, what happens when you mess with science? and force a legendary Pokemon to breed? Fion happens! With one leg and a third arm growing out of a lump on its head, it is a monstrosity born of the loins of Manaphy! Drama aside, it's not very good. <laughs> it's a Manaphy, but with 80 in every stat instead of 100. It has no way to learn Tail Glow, no way to learn Heart Swap, and unlike any other baby Pokemon, it will never evolve into Manaphy. I have broken this news to so many friends who weren't able to get a Manaphy of their own, but were able to get a Fiona from trades. They traded up near level 100, and then eventually broke down and asked me, okay, when the crap does this thing evolve? Telling them the truth about that was the scariest part of all. <laughs> yeah, over the meager after game offerings that you have for us, okay. In Candelave City, to the north is the Harbor Inn. This door is forever locked. You can't do anything about it. Unless you have an event from a while ago. This event would grant you the item, the Member's Card. This would allow you to check in to the sorriest hotel in the entire Sinnoh region. It has one bed in it, no front desk, no lobby, no amenities, nothing. Why would you ever want to stay here? By doing this, it will allow you to fight a Pokemon that you cannot fight otherwise. But before we go onward, this is how I'm going to be covering any sort of events in the after game. A lot of people have been asking about this, and even though you can technically hack that item into your inventory, having the item on its own won't do it. You need to have the Wonder Card data as well, or else the item will do nothing. You can technically modify your save file to do this but I personally didn't want to mess around with that. I'm doing this legit on an actual cartridge of Pokemon Platinum, and I wouldn't want to risk messing up the only save file that I have and doing something wrong, so I didn't want to do that. If you want to do it, go right ahead, but I am going to be covering them, just not by actually playing them. Wanted to get that out of the way. By staying at the Harbor Inn and sleeping in the bed, you too will succumb to the darkness, just as that young boy did. You will go to New Moon Island, just across from Full Moon Island, and you will fight against the source of the nightmares in this world, Darkrai. Darkrai is one of my personal favorite legendary Pokemon of all time. Though it is getting a little bit tiresome how he's the main bad guy in every single Pokemon spin-off game since his introduction. I swear, it's like he's the new Mewtwo or something. But anyway, pure dark type is fun. Darkrai is a powerful special attacker and it learns many great moves such as Dark Pulse, Shadow Ball, and who could forget its signature move of Dark Void. 80% accurate sleep and it hits both opponents in double battles. It is second only to Spore in being the most effective sleeping move in the game. And heck, if you want to argue in double battles, it's technically more effective because it's gonna hit both enemies. Its signature ability makes Dark Void even more effective, causing the opponent to lose HP every turn they are just on the field with it and asleep. 
A fond memory that I have about Darkrai, though, is that the initial Darkrai distributions were not by giving out the member's key to people to let them go catch their own. Instead, they just merely gave you a Darkrai in a Cherish Ball, and it had the moves Roar of Time and Spatial Rend. That thing was a Dragon Slayer, among everything else that you've seen here. It was incredibly powerful, and it was one of the most fond memories I have battling in Ubers long ago. That is everything dealing with Darkrai. But there is one more detail about this event that I need to talk about, because I believe it is one of the most overlooked details in all of Pokemon. The Harbor Inn is a haunted building. It shut down very long ago. These are apparitions that you're seeing inside of it. You enter the dreamlike state and all that stuff. If you look at the member card's item description, it says that the last date marked on it was 50 years ago. If you look at the official artwork, for the member's card. The date on it is December 1st, 1959. The member's card was first distributed in Japan on December 1st, 2009. Exactly 50 years later than that date. That's just darn right cool. It shows how much meticulous detail and thought goes into these games. If they have that in the official artwork down to the exact day 50 years ago. It's just so nice. I love that detail. And I never see anyone talk about it because this event is a little bit remote. Any Route 224 is this white rock. The surface is unmarked. What do you mean? It's got indentations all over the top of it. Polished like a mirror. It's similar to the white stone that is seen in Moss Deep City in Hoenn. However, unlike that white rock, this one actually has a purpose. If you come all the way to the end of Route 224 to this rock with the event item of Oak's Letter, you will meet Professor Oak here, and before you will appear the Sea Break Path, a geographically impossible long featureless route of nothing but flowers. Yeah, not exactly the most intriguing area, but it's interesting in that it's the longest route in any Pokemon game, and something that was not technically possible on the Game Boy Advance. The, um... The limitations of Ruby and Sapphire would not allow for something this long. It's nothing exciting, and it's pretty lame, and you are seeing it in its entirety right now. But at the end of it is the legendary Pokemon, Shaman. Shaman Landform is basically this game's Mew. Every generation's got to have one, and here it is. Base 100 in every stat, but honestly, it's kind of mediocre. The pure grass type doesn't really do it many favors, and the moves that it learns aren't all that impressive. The exception is its signature move, Seed Flare. This is a 120 power special grass type move with 85% accuracy and a 40% chance of sharply lowering the opponent's special defense, which it learns at level 100. <laughs> However, this is not Diamond and Pearl, this is Platinum. And Platinum just loves giving things to Pokemon that needed something in order to be good, and Shaman got that. If you go to Floroma Town, and you talk to this girl right over here, she will give you the Grisadia Flower. She will only give you this if your Shaman was obtained from a fateful encounter. And because of this, Shaman is unique that specifically in Platinum, even if it's caught in the wild, it will always show up as being a fateful encounter. With this item, Shaman can transform into its sky form. Why Shaman needs one of these to transform, I have no idea. It has not one, but two of these things on its body naturally. I guess maybe one's not enough and neither is two, so it has to be exactly three for it to be able to take flight. I can't think of any explanation for this, and it's one of the stranger transformations out there. It becomes Grass Flying type, gains the ability to use Air Slash, and has its stats completely redistributed so it can be a much more offensive Pokemon. This is what makes Shaman worthwhile and makes it really good. It also has Serene Grace for its abilities, so that makes Air Slash even better. There are some downsides, however. It can only be Sky Shaman during the day. It cannot be used in Versus, just like the other new forms that were introduced in Platinum, so it is locked to single player only. And lastly, and I'm not even sure if I'd call this a downside at all, is that it will revert to landform if it is ever frozen, but it's quad weak to ice. When would it ever be frozen from being hit by an ice type move? 
There's no move that just freezes. It straight up would just be knocked out. There's no other way about it. That's it. I have never seen a Sky Shaman ever get frozen in my entire life, but... Maybe if you want to run the Yachi Berry on it, you will see this oh-so-spectacular sight that I have never had bestowed upon me. Cynthia told us that the plates speak of an original one that Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina all spawn from. But no matter what we do atop the Spear Pillar, no such Pokémon will appear. But that is not to say that such a Pokémon does not exist. We have collected all of those plates that speak of its existence. When the universe was created, its shards became these plates. The power of defeated giants infuses these plates. Two beings of time and space set free from the original one. Three beings were born to bind time and space. Two make matter, and three make spirit, shaping the world. The original one breathed alone before the universe came. The powers of plates are shared among Pokémon. The rightful bearer of a plate draws from the plate it holds. The creator of this universe, Arceus. With 120 in every stat, the ability to become any type, and compatibility with nearly every TM, it can be anything. Its signature move is Judgment, which is a 100 power special move that changes type with Arceus. While multi-type and a changeable same type attack bonus sound cool at first, it usually performs best with a Life Orb and either a physical attacking moveset with Swords Dance or a special attacking moveset with Calm Mind, then Recover thrown in to heal off self-inflicted damage from the Life Orb and to make it even more viable as a special wall if it's packing Calm Mind. As a side note regarding moves that it can learn, Dragon Arceus is even capable of learning Draco Meteor through Grandma Wilma. Arceus would have been fought in the Hall of Origin atop the Spear Pillar at level 80. But its event was never released. Not anywhere in the world. Yep, that is three times in a row that we have got something that was intended to be released, but never was. Great track record, guys. Despite the intention being to fight it atop the Spear Pillar in the Hall of Origin, every Arceus ever distributed was merely sent as a gift Pokemon through the attendant in the Pokemart already at level 100. Because of this, Arceus has a distinct nerf. It can never gain experience, so it cannot be EV trained under normal circumstances. But really, when your stat total is 720, who needs custom EV spreads? Simply put, it's God.